Good afternoon, good evening, and for some of you, good morning, and thank you for the applause. Great to be here. Welcome to this online broadcast of the Summit for Democracy 2023, coming to you live from The Hague. My name is Nisha Pele, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. Now, this is the second Summit for Democracy. It's being hosted today across the world, not just here in the Netherlands, but also in Costa Rica, the Republic of Korea, in Zambia, and in the US. But our meeting here in the Netherlands, we are going to be focusing particularly on media freedom in the European region. So we have a European lens on the subject. We're going to be debating here at this table and online. And in keeping with our theme, we're also going to be offering a space for different views on media freedom. Some will be critical, some will be ironic even. Let's see what we get. To this end, we have invited some special creative guests to join us in the studio. We have a cartoonist with us here. We have a stand-up comedian. Who knows what he's going to hit us with? Behind him, some journalism students. And, wait for it, the thing I'm really waiting for, a spoken word artist. You know, I'm not even sure I know what a spoken word artist is. And here in the front row, we have some youth correspondents. That's what they call themselves. They are budding journalists. One day, they're going to take my job over for me. We're going to introduce them in a little while. Let's start our show, though, now with a brief look at the plenary meeting from yesterday, chaired by the Dutch Prime Minister himself, Mark Rutte. Here are some highlights. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session Democracy Delivering Justice for All. One thing stands out from all uh, the contributions uh, as a clear common theme, and that is that democracy really does uh, deliver. Uh, it delivers free, open and creative societies. I think that's why we are here today. And just to highlight a few remarks, and I cannot, of course, summarize everything which has been said, but I was struck by what Prime Minister Kishida Fumio uh, of Japan said, the, the investment Japan is making in the region, but also in Africa to promote democracy. Um, what also, I think, um, was very clear what Prime Minister Al Sudani said of Iraq, that sometimes um, uh, administrative reforms are necessary uh, to promote uh, democracies in our societies. Uh, the Prime Minister of Cabo Verde, uh, Correa e Silva, he said, sometimes you have to fight the slow rate of justice and then it can be extremely helpful to make use of modern technologies, a very practical example of how modern technologies can help. The President of Latvia, Egus Levitz, who said, what happens now in the occupied parts of Ukraine makes it extra important that Russia will be held accountable. The president of Gambia, Adam Abaro, he remembered us of the struggle to restore democracy. And it also reminds us how fragile democracies can be. And of course, the president of Uruguay, who mentioned particularly two things. One is uh, the extended access for justice, to justice for all the citizens, and secondly, he also went into mediation as an option. And finally, again, the president of Latvia, he said, democracy can be a frustrating process, but the results, the outcomes, are always better for society and also the economy. Thank you all for participating, and I wish you a very good day. Thank you so very much, Prime Minister Rutte, for that masterful roundup of yesterday's plenary session. Now, we're going to zoom in on one particular theme, and that is media freedom. Why, you may ask? Because media freedom is really a, a prerequisite, if you like, for a flourishing democracy. And we're going to discuss it along four main themes. Here they are. Why media freedom is a cornerstone for democracy. That's our first discussion. Followed by how to protect journalists' safety and security. That we're going to broaden it out then to look at how to advance freedom of expression online. And finally, a really important thing, which is the financial viability of independent media. How do we bolster it? So let's get started now with our first discussion on media freedom as a cornerstone for democracies. Now, that sounds very grand, doesn't it? But we're going to make it tangible for you. We've got an 
awesome panel of very distinguished guests up ahead. Let me introduce you to them. From the US, Her Excellency Samantha Power, the Administrator of USAID. Welcome. From the Netherlands, His Excellency Wupka Hoekstra, Minister of Foreign Affairs from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. From the Republic of Slovenia, Her Excellency Taya Tanja Fajon, Minister for Foreign and European Affairs. And from the Republic of Kosovo, Her Excellency Ms. Donika Gervela Schwarz, Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Diaspora. And I'm going to ask um, Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, Wupka Hoekstra, to get us going, really, with some words of welcome. Over to you, Minister Hoekstra. Well, thank you, and thank you all very much for being with us here today. And I'm truly honored that we are co-hosting the second summit for democracy for the European region. And that we all are working together as, as great partners to make this summit a success. And you could actually say that the list of co-hosts in itself sends a very powerful message. The message that countries from, from all across the world, uh, from north to south and east to west, actually do believe in democracy. And that we believe in journalism as one of the key cornerstones of democracy. And that we will do everything in our joint power uh, to protect them both. Uh, and such protection, unfortunately, is badly needed. Uh, that, is, that is the unfortunate conclusion we, we do have to acknowledge. Because around the world, uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law are under severe threat. Uh, but so is media freedom. So is media freedom. And the troubling reports on uh, the detainment of a Wall Street journalist reporter, um, Evan Gerskovich, in Russia today, is just one on a very, very long list of many. And the uncomfortable truth is that around the world, uh, journalists are being harassed are being censored, and this is especially true for women, and including in the European region, including in my own country, including in the Netherlands. It was two years ago that our nation was shocked, deeply shocked, by the murder of the well-known Dutch crime reporter Peter R. de Vries in broad daylight in Amsterdam. And the Dutch public uh, service broadcaster has had to remove its logos from its vehicles because of the threats made to the organization. And then, third example, recent studies show that uh, approximately 8 out of 10 journalists in the Netherlands have experienced at least some form of aggression or threat. And many feel, say that they feel that this actually affects their personal lives. And again, especially women. And you can actually see, by thinking about these examples, how much has changed uh, for the worse. And the harsh reality uh, has only increased our de uh, determination, our and also my personal determination, to improve the safety and the security of journalists, uh, of course in the Netherlands, but also across the globe. And it's quite simple, dear friends. It is actually quite simple. If journalists cannot do their work, democracy itself cannot do its work. And that is why this summit is so tremendously important. The media enables citizens to hold their governments to account. It allows them to stay informed, and the media gives a voice to the voiceless. And it is up to us, it is also, frankly speaking, up to all of us here together today to make sure that this voice is being heard. And I therefore um, I would like to uh, close by inviting USAID Administrator uh, Samantha Power, representing the initiator of this summit, the US, to take the floor. And uh, Samantha, thank you very much for being with us, but also for the tremendous leadership your administration has shown um, in, in, in the last couple of years in making sure we put this absolutely uh, essential element of our societies on the very front, forefront of our common agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I cannot overstate what a tremendous partner the Netherlands is on all things related to democracy, human rights, free media. Um, and uh, Minister Huckstra, thank you for your, for your comments just now, for, for your leadership day to day. Um, again, it's a great partnership between our two countries. And thanks to everybody who's there. Uh, in the audience and, and gathered virtually. 
I think, you know, one way to think about the importance of independent media is to reflect on moments when people are forced to live without it. And I was struck last year, Internews Ukraine, uh, an NGO, uh, produced a documentary that showed what happened when Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine cut off one community's access to internet and to TV in eastern Ukraine. And it's so we're also besieged with information and, and social media and regular media. It's, you know, this was like a throwback because the community had no, almost no access to any media for weeks. And there they were at the center of the biggest story in the world with no way of knowing how their fellow Ukrainians were inspiring the world with their resilience, how other nations were rallying behind Ukraine, including, of course, uh, the Netherlands. Um, and then as this documentary depicts, they figured out that they could still access the radio. And immediately the radio became a lifeline uh, for the community. They were able to learn critical information about how people were coming together to, to weather the invasion, um, news you can use, uh, a, a, as you say. But also, as one woman put it, she said, some hope was born in us from hearing that we were not forgotten. And I, there's sort of a profound reminder of even the simple good that, that media can do. And autocrats target independent media because information empowers us. This is not, um, as they say, a, a bug. This is a design feature of repressive rule. And whether people are resisting an invasion, whether they are campaigning to replace corrupt leaders with reformers, taking on climate change, collective action really cannot begin without a collective understanding of the challenges and opportunities uh, in front of us. Uh, Alexei de Tocqueville, back in the day, put it this way. He said, media is how we maintain civilization. And that is uh, high praise, but also, I think, really speaks to the indispensability. So as you alluded to, uh, Mr. Minister, um, independent media is facing existential challenges at the moment. One of them is what you talked about, which is a direct onslaught from autocrats. Another is the financial health crisis spurred by this rapidly transforming media environment. And this summit, I think, has spent a lot of time talking about Freedom House's research on freedom in the world, because it gives us a baseline year to year to measure trends. Um, what's noteworthy and maybe gets a little bit less attention is that actually for all of the declining indicators among human rights and civil liberties that their research tracks, freedom of the media and freedom of expression have declined the most. In the past 17 years, the number of countries that have a score of zero out of four on the media freedom indicator has more than doubled from 14 to 33. And again, that aligns with the 17 straight years of freedom uh, in decline. Powerful people who seek to control the narrative spread inaccurate information uh, to drown out the truth. They silence journalists. We not only now have intimidation and threats and violence uh, and jail sentences, but now repressive actors are using the lawsuit with great sophistication. Reporters Without Borders estimates that over the past two decades, the number of journalists killed for their works for their work averaged 80 per year. And then on the business side, which is something we talked about at an event yesterday, um, some are referring uh, to the threat to independent media as, and local media especially, as a media extinction event. Global newspaper ad revenue dropped by half in the last five years, ad of course shifting from traditional to online. Just two companies, Facebook and Google, captured half of the total global digital advertising spend in 2020, the latest year for which we have figures. It's probably higher now. Um, and when it comes to developing countries where USAID works around the world, global advertisers often either don't advertise in those markets or they pay less to show their ads, which reduces revenue even more. And so we're seeing opinion news, so-called news, entertainment-based news over straight reporting. We're seeing social media instead of fact-checked sources, and this is a challenge uh, for us all. So we have some ideas. I think together uh, we're partnering with fellow democracies uh, to try to recognize these two distinct challenges and come up with tools uh, to address them. 
talk to us a Thank bit you. about some of those tools, Ad Administrator Powell. You've laid out a number of challenges for us, and we're going to be dissecting them over the course of the next meeting that we're conducting. But from a US government policy point of view, what do you see as the key tools that might be able to address some of those challenges? Well, I actually did an event yesterday uh, with this, the uh, president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, um, about a new public-private partnership that we are launching with Microsoft, uh, with Internews, with a number of other players. I want to use this occasion as a call to action for anybody who finds this intriguing and would like to get involved uh, or to join. But on the financial side, where I ended, I would say it, this question of media viability, we, you know, we can't just lament the winds, the changing seasons, and the rise of social media and what it does to independent media. We have to try to break down the problem uh, and, and address it. And so this partnership that we've pulled together draws on work USAID has done around the world, where when you see, uh, let's say, you know, traditional print media trying to make the transition to online and it not working, sometimes they, they just, they actually just need better data. They need market surveys. They need to understand subscription bases. They need to make that transition that our major you know, uh, newspapers and, and have made here in the United States, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, you know, what, what does it mean to, to, to transition uh, to uh, online uh, subscription bases and make it profitable, you know, or at least viable, if not, uh, you know, a massive uh, uh, profit. So basically, Microsoft is working with us to help small media companies get the kind of data and analytic resources that big media conglomerates like those I just mentioned have been able to have over the years, but it's the smaller, there's just a market failure there. So we have to address that and not lament it. And then I mentioned the, the use of the lawsuit. I do think this is like a growing phenomenon where they're very clever, corrupt actors, repressive actors. They see they've got you know uh, deeper pockets and some of these plucky NGOs or independent journalists don't have the money uh, to be able to withstand, you know, being sued, and that drives these individuals or these companies, small, you know, NGOs, uh, these organizations out of business. So um, USAID has started, along with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and the Cyrus Vance Center for International Justice, uh, a new kind of public insurance fund, a pooled fund called Reporter Shield. Again. Uh, an insurance fund, and I, I just give you one example to concretize what it is, but basically journalists or NGOs could buy into this. Um, in Serbia, there's a small investigative journalism organization called CRIC, and it is currently dealing, and this is very illustrative of what's happening around the world, with 11 lawsuits from powerful forces trying to shut down their reporting. These actors or these bad actors are seeking a million dollars in damages, and that's more than three times CRIC's annual budget. So Reporter Shield aims, if we can really crowd in more resources, we can do this at scale, to provide the tools for outlets like Crick to stay in business while they fend off these lawsuits. So even if they have facts and truth on their side, sometimes they just the mere fact of the lawsuit is enough uh, to quell their reporting or even quell their, their uh, you know, eradicate the, the, the publication of the organization itself. So we're going to be supporting legal defense of investigative journalists, provide pro and low bono legal support via law, for, law firms, and again, ensure that they have uh, insurance you know, over time again, especially when we can scale this because this is such a, a broad-based phenomenon to give them that protection uh, and that knowledge that we will stand with them in those, in those moments of crisis. Brilliant. Good to hear that. I must say, as a former investigative journalist, it's music to my ears. Administrator Power, thank you so much for joining us at this Summit for Democracy event here in the Netherlands. So we're going to now show you a short video which draws together some of those themes that uh, Administrator Power was just talking to us about. Um, and I, a, a quick word of warning, some of the images in our, our video are quite disturbing. Media freedom and freedom of expression are under constant pressure. The very fact that the journalists are special targets. Over the past five years, approximately 85% of the world's population experienced the decline in media freedom. 
Reporters and news photographers are increasingly confronted with harassment and violence. <laughs> Journalists are threatened not only verbally, but also physically. A survey by UNESCO shows that 73% of women journalists have been harassed online. With the rise of autocratic regimes, independent media come under further pressure. The fear of violence or persecution leads to self-censorship. The Moscow Times was forced to move its entire editorial office to Amsterdam. It was the only way to continue working independently. In Hungary, the radio station Club Radio, one of the last radio stations not under government influence, lost its broadcast license after being accused of infringing administrative rules. As we all know, a free, independent media landscape is a prerequisite for every well-functioning democracy. I got arrested. It is literally my job to do that. Numerous news organizations worldwide are struggling to survive financially. The COVID pandemic was an additional setback. In these turbulent times, reliable news media are needed more than ever. For the preservation of free and independent media, we must consider media freedom as an absolute priority. So that video really illustrated the way in which media freedoms are being encroached upon worldwide. We're going to take on this discussion now in the European context. And I'd like to ask Minister Hoekstra first, what are you doing here then in the Netherlands? Can you give us some concrete examples of measures you think might help to address these many challenges? Minister Hoekstra, I think we're having some problems with your sound, if you don't mind my saying. Is it, is it better That's now? That's perfect. Why don't you start again? What is the Netherlands doing to try and address some of these challenges? Well, thank you. And, and first, let me, let me acknowledge that, that this is indeed a, a quite, quite disturbing video with examples that, that, that we do need to, to address. And in, in, in my mind, it starts with the recognition uh, that this is indeed a, uh, as an American writer once, once called, a, a big, hairy and wicked problem. Uh, and there's not a, a shortcut, there's not an easy solution to it. Um, and, and therefore, the last thing we should do is think that any one of us could solve this in, in, in splendid isolation. It is truly something that asks for teamwork, for building coalitions and, and doing stuff uh, really together. And um, there, there, there are three examples from my own experience that, that come to mind, and I'll mention them briefly. One is the uh, what we call the Media Freedom Cohort. We set up together with uh, our Canadian friends and with Internews. And it's an initiative that now embodies, I think, 27 states and over 90 civil society and private sector organizations. And it is basically a forum where we can share best practices on, on what is happening. So that will be one. The, the second one, and, and it is not a coincidence that we're also doing that together with, with Canada, is the Media Freedom Coalition uh, that, we do, that we chair. And through this coalition, we develop uh, embassy networks in countries where media freedom is under pressure, um, and trying to, to, to help out local media over there, um, uh, training um, uh, journalists, uh, funding um, uh, invest investigative journalists, and making sure that this is uh, in, at the very forefront of the agenda of the European Union. And the good news is here that the coalition and the EU just signed a document in which they agreed to work together more closely. And that is important because therefore it gets on the uh, agenda of all uh, European Union member states. And the third one, and that is an example more from back home, uh, we have to acknowledge that we have this problem here in the Netherlands, unfortunately, as well. Uh, and we have this cooperation platform called uh, Pers Veilig. Many in the room, at least many of the Dutchies, will probably know it. Uh, you, would, you would translate that into press safety. And that is a, 
um, uh, a cooperation platform for journalists, for uh, the police, for the government, uh, for uh, the justice sector in the Netherlands to make sure that whatever happens or, or might actually happen to journalists is addressed right away. Um, uh, and with this forum, we do make sure that, you know, reports, um, uh, threats of violence uh, and the follow up on that uh, are dealt with uh, uh, immediately. And I was, I was actually, I was, we were having a, a state visit to, to Slovakia a couple of weeks ago. And, and actually, it was very interesting to see there that a Dutch police officer and a Dutch journalist were describing how they are working together in this cooperation platform called Persveilig. Now, this is not going to be the end of it. And, and, and much more is needed. But I think the basic message is that doing stuff together every single day again and making sure we broaden the coalition of people uh, who put energy in this is absolutely essential in addressing this. Good to hear that, Minister Hoekstra. In fact, we're going to be joined by the Culture Minister of Slovakia a little in, in shortly. And um, one of the things I'm going to ask her is about how she sees the relevance of Persvaila in the Slovakian context. So thank you for raising it already. I'd like to turn now to Minister Garvala Schwarz in the Republic of Kosovo. Can you reflect on the extent to which the Ukraine war and the explosion of social media that we've seen is shifting journalists' focus away from reporting to having to counteract fake media? Minister, I think we're having problems with your sound. Do you want to start again? Yes. So, can you hear me now? We can indeed. Do go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me please start very personal. My father was a journalist, and as a dissident in former communist Yugoslavia, he had to flee the country and went to Germany. When I was 10 years old, he has been assassinated by the Serbia-dominated Yugoslav Secret Service in Germany at the back of our house. Even in 2022, on government-controlled Serbian television in Europe, a former agent responsible for the planning of such assassinations took pride in the killing of my father, for example. That is the reality in Serbia, that's in Europe in the year 22 and 23, and this is important to know. So I'm mentioning this just to demonstrate that it is not about nice wording only and not about abstract goals, because the threat for to liberty, democracy, and free media is real. Now, how to win the struggle against fake news? In Kosovo, we are a democratic and resilient country when it comes to fake news. We lived under a Serbian regime, aggressive, which was portraying us as a minor race. Like Putin wants to strip off the Ukrainians of their dignity, of their right to exist. Serbia did the same against Kosovo, later waging war against its whole population and trying to expel us altogether from our territory in 1999. The Serb Minister for Information, meaning fake news and lies, during this genocide was somebody called Vucic. Today, as an independent country, we are hosting Ukrainian journalists. We help them to establish a powerful hub of journalism and at the same time a powerful center for countering fake news related to Ukraine and Russia. Since that turned to be a real success, we now are sheltering Afghan journalists as well. Why is this so powerful? Because thanks to the internet, spreading of real news and information is as easy as the spreading of fake news. And effectively, in countering lies and fake news is possible literally from everywhere. So I would urge every colleague in every country to undertake similar efforts. As long as we do hesitate to provide the good guys with what they need to fight the output of the bad guys, then the bad ones will have the upper hand. So it's about our determination if you will lose or win this fight for truth, democracy, and liberty. We in Kosovo would be help, ready to help and to assist. 
Thank you so much, Minister Garvala Schatz, and also for sharing your personal perspective on this subject, which is clearly so close to heart for you. I'd like to just bring in the Foreign Minister for uh, Slovenia now. We're, we, all we're talking about right now is uh, fake news, disinformation, we're swimming in this world. What are the remedies? What are you doing in Slovenia, do you think? What, give, give us your perspective. Um, thank you very much. First of all, my sincere gratitude to the host of uh, Kingdom of Netherlands for hosting us at this um, summit uh, for democracy. Um, disinformation is for me, or the, the spread of disinformation is for me a, a very frustrating process. I mean, I was a journalist myself, so I also have a personal angle for many years. And I can see uh, it's not new disinformation or fake news, but the spread or the internet. So the spread of disinformation and the use and the tool, this is what is a frustrating process. Now, what I can say is when um, we are talking about disinformation or fake news, we can see that it has a tremendous impact on the democracy, especially when we look in the context of impact on the political process or on the elections, what we can face in many countries uh, around the Europe. Just give you one very worrying fact that um, majority of people who read fake news um, are those that are actually even voting more than others. So that means that quite often we get leaders that are also part of the society that is following the fake news and disinformation. And what worries me even more, today when you have social media and everyone can write everything they want, uh, be it even with anonymous, no face, no name, and when that comes part of the mainstream media or it enters or use politicians, um, mainstream politicians start using this disinformation and fake news, um, then it becomes a problem. We can face that in many elections uh, around Europe. We face that basically also in Slovenia. And what we can do, young people, um, pupils, they cannot distinguish, even not older generation, what is true, what is false. So we have a big challenge and we have to start raising awareness, education with young generation in schools. This is certainly what we have to do. And what mainstream media or national media, they have really a task to have credible and professional journalism. We as politicians have to establish the environment for that. But for example, in some of the countries with elections, what we are trying to do, we have to support media to organize fact-finding so that they are really trying to counter disinformation and fake news with their own system of fact-finding desks, but also some self-regulation and really protect the journalism and the freedom of expression. So there are a lot of challenges. And when we look at the social media itself, I was in my previous capacity working a lot on disinformation in fake news, how to deal with big platforms, uh, where, of course, um, there are always some steps ahead of um, um, politics or regulation, what we are capable to do. So there is a lot of codex, a lot of rules, and it's a, our common challenge to address this. And uh, of course, on platforms, but this is already another topic, it's not only disinformation and fake news, but the impact of social media on a med media landscape, it's an enormous and huge. So we have to be aware of that, um, but we have to, I'm speaking now as a politician, we have to first, those that keep public posts as mainstream politicians, so media that play a very important role, we have to be an example. We have to behave in a professional, credible way and take care what kind of information we are passing to our society. And be aware that it's not only a threat to democracy, but in connection with that, it's a huge threat to um, our electoral system, our political or voting results, and of course, with that, um, um, an impact to the future of our countries and societies.
Minister Fayon, what can I say? You've really demonstrated why this subject, the freedom of the media and credible media, is so vital for the democratic process. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and so I'm going to bring Minister Huxra back into our conversation. You were telling us about how you know, targeting journalists is an issue here, even in the Netherlands, which is something that many people might not really expect. What can be done to bring perpetrators to justice? Well, well, first, it, uh, let, me, let me say, because it is important to be, to be crystal clear about this, that it is actually very hard to, uh, to accept, and we should never accept the fact that uh, if you look at the, 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 the victims um, of these type of crimes, uh, they overwhelmingly never actually uh, receive justice. Uh, and the ugly truth is that worldwide, the vast majority of perpetrators go unpunished. And as long as that continues, uh, the problem will continue. Um, and, and, and therefore, I have two, two types of comments. One is uh, all the, 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 the regular logic that applies in criminology applies here as well. Uh, so you need to have uh, a high chance of, 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 uh, of actually being able to catch the people, the, the perpetrators who do this. Secondly, you need to make sure that people get busted uh, quickly and then they have a trial uh, relatively soon, uh, and not years and years later. And third, you need to make sure that punishment is not necessarily extremely harsh, but that it is sufficiently significant to make sure that it serves as a deterrent. And that is always true, and, and it is something we need to apply much more in, in this specific case as well. The second thing we are looking into is, um, is something that is more in the category of thinking outside of the, uh, of the box. One of the ideas we are currently looking into is would it be possible and what are the upside and potentially also the downsides of creating an standing international investigative team that can actually quickly de deploy to these type of crime scenes. Uh, and what we will do and what I can announce today is that we will research the, poss the possibilities and the upside and potentially the downsides of creating such a team um, that could potentially help making sure that this topic that is so tremendously important to all of us really gets on the top of the agenda wherever things go wrong. Thank you, Minister Hoekstra. Would you like to give us some final words to round off this segment of our meeting? Yeah, I, I will, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief, because many things have been said, and I, I know there, is, there, there, there are many other participants who will be joining. Um, the, Maybe, maybe, maybe two, two comments. One is, you know, the good news is that uh, by organizing these type of get-togethers, um, the, the topic actually gets on the agenda. And it is fantastic that, you know, the, the, the Biden administration has once again put its full weight behind this event. And you immediately see that it actually generates traction. I got a number of questions earlier this week from the media about, you know, uh, what does actually a summit solve? And well, you know, you might be tempted to think that a summit in itself doesn't uh, solve that much. But at the same time, attention, focus, making sure that people know that this is a problem is actually at the heart of the solution. And we have received over 120 commitments from states and civil society and private sector organizations, all willing to take extra steps on, uh, on this topic, on the topic of media freedom. Uh, so it actually does generate a, a lot of traction. That is very good news. And I thank everyone involved uh, with you in the room, but also across the globe with, uh, for, for, for taking these extra steps. And I think the second part, this work is never over. This work truly is never over. Um, uh, we, we, we all know the saying that, you know, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Well, actually, that is true. And it is as true today in 2023 as it was ever before. So there is work that we all individually, but also with our organizations and in working together have to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Hoekstra, and indeed to Ministers Fayon and Gervala Schwarz. Thank you for your commitment and for speaking so bluntly and openly with us. We appreciate it. Now, you may recall that Minister Hoekstra mentioned earlier that the Netherlands, together with Canada, have led the Media Freedom Cohort. Well, as co-chairs of this initiative, Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Melanie Jolie, sent us this message of support. Let's have a listen. 
Des médias libres et indépendants sont un élément essentiel d'une démocratie saine. C'est ce qui permet d'ailleurs à une démocratie de demeurer informée, d'apprendre et de croître. Media freedom is not only about citizens having access to independent, accurate and reliable information, it's also about protecting the rights of journalists and media workers. From Ukraine to Iran, we have seen journalists and media workers risk their lives in order to share important stories, bring truth to power and to shed light on the dark corners of our world. Every day, they risk their lives in order to give it voice to the oppressed. And with the increasing rise of disinformation, it is critical that now, more than ever, we stand with them. As co-chair of the Media Freedom Coalition, Canada, alongside our Dutch partners, is committed to continuing the fight for free and independent media. As leaders on the world stage, this is our duty. We know that a collaborative approach, one that brings people together from across society, is the only way to successfully support media freedom. And it is summits like this one that give us the opportunity to do just that. Thank you to President Biden and Secretary Blinken, our American partners who have led the summit since 2021. To Wopke Okstra, our Dutch colleague and friend, for hosting this event and to all participating in today's discussion. Together, we're working towards a better society one where media freedom is upheld, protected, and respected globally. Thank you very much, Minister Jolie. And now, embracing the spirit of freedom of expression fully, let me introduce you to our special guests. Uh, they're going to be listening into our discussions, remember? They're going to share with us their own creative responses. Well, here's the first of our guests, Lev Avitan, your spoken word artist. Yes, I What am. What can we expect from you, Lev? Um, observing today the event and I'm writing, seeing what it does with me and I'm writing a piece concluding the event. And this piece is going to be a bit of poetry or is it, it going to be, be a bit of music? Are you going to sing for us? No, what can we expect? no, you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's poetry, uh, but based, written for performance. So oh, wow. It's, uh, and have you been be making some notes? Have yeah, you been a lot. studying? A lot. Oh, he's turning into a journalist himself. I can't we wait hope, to see it, hope. Lev. And he's Thank going you. to to roll our, our meeting out, as it were. Let's cross over now and meet Martin, our cartoonist. Have you started working already, Martin? I see you've got, oh, I'm you afraid have, so. haven't yes, you? I this am. is Martin Volterink, dear friends and colleagues. What are you up to? He's got an iPad. Oh, I thought you meant that guy. No, I have the iPad, yes, of course, yes. Why do you use an iPad? Uh, it's all much quicker <laughs> and smoother. You don't uh, need a lot of paper, so it's also uh, uh, very good for the environment. But I love this one. So when did you start working <laughs> as the Minister of Fake News? <laughs> um, yeah. How many can we expect? Are you, are you going to do just one cartoon for us, or is it a whole tapestry of them? Yeah, I do just one, so I'm finished now. No, no, no. <laughs> no. It, it will be a lot of them, and uh, I guess I, uh, it will be about 10 or 12. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're working you hard. Thank okay. you very much, Keep giving Mart. input. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, let me introduce you to Greg Shapiro. Now, who is Greg? He is a Dutch-American stand-up comedian. He's very well known for looking at Dutch society in a quirky way through American eyes. Now, we have asked Greg to celebrate the importance of humor, irony, the importance of taking life not very reverently, because that's what we're here to talk about, aren't we? The freedom of expression. So take it away, Greg. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. Uh, as we've said, yeah, I'm uh, Greg Shapiro, uh, the American Netherlander. I am a little bit of both. Uh, a little bit uh, loud American, and also uh, a little bit do normal. Dutch person I've been living here so long. So uh, censoring myself because I'm talking too loud, that is a subject that I know a lot about. Uh, but uh, yeah, I am a, a typical expat. I'm representing, you know, America first, and then I moved to the Netherlands second. And uh, yes, I was going to admit that that was my voice in that video. The video, the Netherlands second video, they went so viral back when viral meant a good thing. Uh, but since we're living in a country, the Netherlands, where sometimes journalists have to hide 
their network affiliation for fear of being attacked for their network affiliation. Let's just say you didn't hear it from me. Uh, but since we're on the topic, uh, as a fair warning, this is not journalism, okay? You can use your critical thinking. This is fake. It's totally fake. Fake news. Okay. Uh, but it is. It's, it's an honor uh, to be here today uh, speaking for this live stream about the freedom of speech. This live stream, which I was told was not originally going to be live in the United States because they wanted maybe to censor some of the content on the freedom of speech. Censoring the freedom, yeah. America, almost 250 years old, still trying to grasp that basic concept of irony. Uh, or as my British colleagues like to say, irony and America, it's what we call the Omega effect. It goes right over your heads. Uh, <laughs> but then again, I mean, UK is a country that talks a lot about being a mature democracy, and then they turn around and ban a sports journalist for supporting human rights on Twitter. Uh, so, yeah, a little irony for you there. And I'm sorry to the UK, we're talking about the media landscape in Europe. I did not mean to apply, imply that you're part of Europe. Uh, okay. But... I'm sorry if any of this might be offensive. That was the point. That was the briefing I got. And as the famous quote says, uh, you know, I, I might not agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And who wrote that? The famous French philosopher Voltaire, causing a lot of Americans to say, wasn't that the bad guy from the Harry Potter books? I think we should cancel him, cancel the quote, cancel the books, ban the bu burn the books. And that, sorry, that is an exaggeration. We do not burn books in America. First, we throw them in the water, and if they float, then we burn them. Uh, sorry, that's not, it's not true. But I mean, censorship is something that is not just true to journalism. It's kind of all across our cultures now. Uh, in America, some far-right people are banning books because they talk about homosexuality, or they imply that slavery might have been a bit racist. And oddly, on the far left, we're also canceling some books because they use the N-word or because they're written by Roald Dahl. Uh, so oddly, banning books might be one thing that could unite the far left and the far right in America. The good news is, at least we would finally understand the true meaning of the word irony. I've been the American Netherlander, Greg Shapiro, saying thank you very Dutch. <laughs> You're the best, Greg. I can't wait to join one of your shows. I'm going to Amsterdam this weekend, and I'm going to look you up. Now, we asked Greg, dear friends and colleagues, to give us a kind of light-hearted view of the role of the media, how hypocritical we, we are ourselves, and how we shouldn't take everything too seriously. But why did we ask him to do that? Because the context in which journalists work has become ever more serious and ever more dangerous, and we thought a moment of levity might be appreciated. As we saw in our video earlier, journalists themselves have become a target. So for the media to perform its democratic function, as we've heard from our political speakers earlier, journalists must be able to work without fear of harassment, arrest, or violence. So that's what we're going to discuss now, the safety and security of journalists. And here are our panelists. I'm delighted to say that we're joined from the Slovak Republic by the Minister of Culture, Natalia Milanova. From the, minister, from the United Kingdom, from the Minister for Security, Tom Tugendhat. The OSCE representative for the freedom of the media is Teresa Ribeiro and joins us here in the studio. And Executive Director for Free Press Unlimited is Ruth Cronenberg, and she's with me too. Before we get stuck into this debate as to what we can do to keep journalists safe, here's a short video on some of the very serious threats faced by journalists in the course of their normal work. Journalism remains one of the most dangerous professions with great risks involved. From 2016 to 2021, a total of 455 journalists were killed, of which 27 were in Europe and North America. Last year, Ukraine was the deadliest country for journalists to work in. 12 journalists were killed. Journalists have been killed because they practice their profession in the belief that people have a right to correct information. 
but also off the battlefield, journalists are in danger. Investigative journalists researching delicate matters sometimes have to fear for their lives. Recent examples are the brutal murders of Jan Kuziak and his fiancée Martina Kuznirova, and the Greek and Dutch crime reporters Georgios Karaivas and Peter R. de Vries. For the murder of Kuziak and his fiancée, a man was convicted. But nine out of ten killings of journalists remain unsolved. Impunity for crimes against journalists remains shockingly high. And although murder is an exception, an increasing number of journalists experience harassment and violence while practicing their profession. Journalists are also more often threatened digitally. Women journalists in particular are often harassed and threatened online. And he said uh, in Serbian, I'm going to be killed with a sword. There was this man who was calling me, told me that uh, I wasn't safe and uh, I might get raped. More and more governments are abusing surveillance technology to target journalists, violating their fundamental rights and freedom. What we saw now is that the police installed spyware programs on highly ranked officials and people who are politically exposed. The extent to which governments want to go in this was dramatically revealed with the arrest of Belarusian blogger Roman Protasevich. He was arrested after a false bomb threat forced his plane to land. Journalists' safety and security is a prerequisite for professional and independent journalism. It is clear that we need to do more to ensure that journalists and media workers can work safely and free of fear of intimidation, harassment, repression or violence. So let's start now uh, with Minister Milanova. Um, Minister, if I could uh, ask you what the Slovak government has been doing to protect vulnerable journalists. It's five years, after all, since the murder of Jan Kuchak and his fiancée, Martina Kuznirova, and we, we saw how there was a huge public outcry following the murder. It was such a shocking event. People came coming out onto the streets, a government fell. So how has your government, the new government, tackled this issue? Thank you for the question. Uh, during my term in office, we have made efforts to make priority of this. And it was really not easy because during the previous government, there was nothing done, nothing. Despite that, we managed to adopt new media legislation, which, among other things, uh, re-established and broadened the protection of journalist sources an underlying principle of editorial independence. Furthermore, we also worked with the Ministry of Justice uh, to change our criminal law in order to introduce higher penalties for attacks on journalists and change the criminal offense of libel. My ministry can do everything that is needed uh, since we have limited competen competencies, but uh, we can act as a mediator. We can help initiate a dialogue between the police and journalists, provide assistance or initiatives for measures that need to be taken by journalist associations themselves. Uh, we manage to organize various negotiations workshops and conferences. And as a result of such efforts, the police are now establishing contact points for threats to journalists. We are also uh, including protection of journalists in uh, to important policy documents, for example, cultural police or criminality prevention. Uh, last but uh, not least, I'm glad to finally see also activity from journalists themselves. I'm sad to say uh, that unlike uh, in the Netherlands, Journalists in Slovakia are not organized. They, uh, there have only been uh, individual statements, but uh, 
they did not to come with a united front and a clear vision on how to deal with this problem. Now, uh, thanks to Inve Investigative Center of uh, Jan Kuciak, this is slowly changing. Uh, so I hope that uh, their website and uh, how to deal with threats uh, to journalists and monitor them is just uh, a beginning. Thank you very much, Minister Milanova. Minister Tugendhat, we heard earlier from Foreign Minister Wupke Hoekstra about many challenges that journalists in the Netherlands have been facing, both physical and online. How would you describe the kind of threats that journalists face in the UK? Well, by and large, the answer is journalists in the UK are extremely safe. The tragedy is that in some specific instances, we've seen this change. And the reality is that that's cut, sadly, from foreign threats in many areas. We've seen Iran International in the United Kingdom particularly targeted uh, by the tyranny in Tehran, who are trying to silence opposition by silencing those who are criticizing or who are raising or who are just simply reporting on what is happening in Iran and when they're doing it from overseas. Now, that's led to us, sadly, having to warn some of those journalists that their current location was unsafe, and we've been able to help them to find alternative possible sites. In fact, I've even given them an interview outside Parliament, so uh, I'm pretty confident that they are safe, as you can imagine. But the reality is that what we're seeing is we're seeing increasing challenges. Now, I've just spoken there about physical threats, but the reality is this isn't just about physical threats. The sad reality is that we're seeing foreign countries target not just physically, but also digitally. We're seeing the reality of disinformation spreading into uh, the arenas that were once used for communications between family and friends, becoming avenues for propaganda. And that's where we've really got to do much more work. Now, we're seeing certainly an explosion of it from what we're seeing out of Russia and Ukraine. The news that uh, is being pushed out on Telegram and on other sites where the Russian control is very strong, has meant that we've got an especial challenge. It makes it much harder for many people to see what is actually going on. And instead, they're influenced uh, by the disinformation that's being pumped out. Now, this is where we set up things like the Defending Democracy Task Force, because this summit for democracy is about nothing if it's not about defending people's ability to choose and to choose freely. They can only do that, of course, on the basis of free information and an open society. So that's why the Defending Democracy Task Force that I chair is so essential to making sure that we remain a free country and to making sure that we're able to access those freedoms that make us safe. Thank you very much, Tom Tugendhat. Um, Teresa Ribeiro, so you're charged with a mandate of safeguarding the freedom of the media in the OSCE region. So broaden this discussion out for us. We've heard from specific countries. Are you seeing trends confirming this pattern across the region? Yes, definitely. But first of all, uh, let me uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think it's a, a very good opportunity to talk about this very important uh, topics uh, within the framework of a summit for democracy. I think it's very, very important and I'm very grateful uh, for that because uh, uh, we need this, uh, this uh, nexus uh, uh, completely present uh, in our everyday life, that media freedom is central and is crucial if you want to have democracy. It has been said, of course, but uh, we, sh we, we should keep repeating us. Okay, regarding, uh, regarding, uh, regarding the situation in the OSC, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's uh, a wide, uh, the OSC is a wide membership uh, with 57 participating states from uh, Vladivostok to Vancouver. So with a very, very diverse context, uh, with uh, very different uh, uh, different realities, uh, and uh, but unfortunately, what we can confirm is this trend uh, regarding uh, the lack of safety of journalists is very present, and it's not improving at all. Uh, last year was the deadliest year 
uh, regarding uh, regarding uh, uh, journalists. Last year was the deadliest year. Yes, it was. So it it means a lot, uh, and it means it, and it clearly shows that we have uh, to invest a lot in the safety of journalists. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, hearing a, a very paying attention to what uh, the minister from Slovakia uh, was saying it, and it is very important. It is very important uh, because she said, okay, I have to talk with the minister of justice, with, uh, with different stakeholders within the government, which means that uh, we need a kind of a whole of government uh, to really uh, tackle the problem of the safety of journalists. It's not just about the Minister of Information mm. or the Minister of Culture. No, it's much more than that. The parliament is also important. So, And uh, at the national level, it's very important. The government is very committed. Also, other stakeholders like uh, uh, the news media, the, the organizations of civil society, the journalists, unions, etc. So it's quite complicated, but if you want really to have uh, and to, to create a, 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 a Nelsi uh, atmosphere for the journalists to work freely, uh, we have to work together and uh, in a multi-dimensional uh, way. Well, um, Teresa Ribeiro, you brought me very nicely on to introducing Ruth Cronenberg here because she um, runs Free Press Unlimited, who's a really strong voice in civil society, working to uh, champion the rights of journalists. And yesterday, uh, the FPU organized a multi-stakeholder meeting. It brought together government representatives, private sector, civil society, just what Teresa Ribeiro has just been urging. Um, and here are some of the main messages from yesterday's event. We're here to preserve democracy. We can only do that if media freedom is protected then democracies can flourish and thrive. The word for democracy in, in Ghana, for example, is Kabima Minkembi, which is literally translated as say some and let me say some. Nicaraguan journalism in general has been the ability to learn and to teach from journalists and media outlets from all over the world. We really need to invest much more globally into producing high quality accountability journalism. How do we protect journalist safety better? There were two key points, coordination and enabling the environment. We identified that it is very important uh, to coordinate better on a local level, so on the ground. We would like to see uh, states focus on the best practices and cherry pick um, the good legislative frameworks um, to advance freedom of expression. To support of society to be able to represent public interest, small, medium community uh, organizations. Let's bring this forward and let's do it. Thank you. So Ruth Cronenberg, those are just a few of the messages from yesterday. It was my pleasure to work with you at this important meeting. Um, now, there was a working group that's been together for the last several months, and they fed back some recommendations on this very topic, the safety and security of journalists. Can you summarize what those recommendations were for us? Of course, uh, I will do my best. Thank you for having me. I first want to thank all the members of the working groups of these media cohort, freedom cohort, for the tremendous work, as you already mentioned. Um, they've done so much in just a couple of months. And um, the outcome is actually f fantastic. 121 pledges were made by the multi-stakeholders, so states, but also the private sector and the civil society. Um, I'll try to do justice to uh, some of the main outcomes of the safety working group. And the first is um, that um, they all agreed to improve on the coordination both on local and national level. Um, and it would be fantastic if uh, the, the diplomatic networks of the MFC, the Media Freedom Cohort, actually would... Uh, take this as a starting point. And uh, the second one is governments actually have a duty to create an enabling environment for media and journalists to operate safely. 
And for that, they have to um, promote the trust in journalism. They have to invest in media literacy and create awareness uh, that of the importance of media freedom. And lastly, I would say um, one of the recommendations is, and that's a very uh, valid one, um, please talk with the media rather than about the media. Uh, that is basically uh, also this morning we had a, a, a nice session on this and uh, these are the main recommendations and I sincerely hope that uh, uh, other states will uh, follow them. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, Minister Milanova, the uh, Slo Slovakia recently had a media freedom conference, excellent thing. Um, a survey was published at the conference which indicated that two-thirds of Slovak journalists feel that they faced threats or attacks in the last year alone. So there's clearly a long, long way to go, despite the measures your government has taken. I understand that Slovakia is now working together with the Netherlands on this uh, Persfeilich initiative. We heard about it from Foreign Minister Hoekstra earlier. Press safety, it's all about. So why is that going to be relevant for you in the Slovakian context? How do you see it, how the, uh, the lessons from the Netherlands working for you? I have to say that uh, it is not just Paris um, Feilich, uh, but also the Dutch ambassador to Slovakia and representatives from the Dutch police who have greatly contributed to the dialogue and non-legislative changes in my country. Um, it was the workshop organized by the Slovak Ministry of Culture together with the representatives from Paris Feilich and Dutch police that inspired the first survey about the safety of journalists in Slovakia. Uh, we don't have a Slovak version of uh, Pers Feilich because we don't have uh, journalist organizations to lead it, but uh, some elements of uh, Pers Feilich are being slowly implemented by journalist initiatives and public bodies. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we've been talking an awful lot about policy, haven't you? But I'd like to put a slightly personal question to Minister Tugendhat, if I may. Um, you've been a journalist yourself, haven't you, back in the day? You've worked in Afghanistan, you've worked in Iraq for the British Foreign Office and the British Army, and you've worked, therefore, alongside journalists in very tricky um, uh, security situations. So wh what's your personal take on what's at stake here, what we're discussing? Well, I think it fundamentally matters. I mean, I was, a, I was a journalist in Beirut in the late 90s when there was still uh, conflict around the country. And it was, uh, it was relatively safe compared to some of the years before it, but it was certainly not, uh, it was certainly not a safe country. And uh, I think that journalism is one of the fundamental freedoms, not just for the British people, but for everybody around the world. And so I, the reason this matters to me, the reason we've set up the Defending Democracy Task Force and the reason that uh, I'm with you today for this summit of democracies is because if we want to have a safe and open society where British people and everybody else, Europeans and everybody else can travel and trade and live and love wherever they choose, then we need to have countries and cultures that understand each other. And that's not possible with journalism and it's not possible without free uh, and fair means of communication. And that's why disinformation uh, protection matters so much and that's why our government, the British government, is doing so much and working with many of you around the world and none more so than with our, our Dutch friends. Thank you very much, Minister Tugendhat. Um, Teresa Ribeiro, I particularly want to ask you about the threats that women journalists face. We've heard from a number of ministers earlier about that extremely sexualized and hostile language, rape threats we heard about in our video. What can we actually do to protect women journalists in the front line, apart from just lamenting the situation? Yes, this is, uh, this is uh, a horrifying, I would say, uh, a horrifying uh, um, state of, uh, of art we, we have regarding, uh, uh, regarding the, the women, uh, women journalists being, uh, being constantly harassed. Uh, and uh, let me just give you some statistics that uh, can can uh, give us a little bit uh, uh, the the the, uh, the the picture of the situation. Seventy percent of the women, uh, 70, 
73 percent of women journalists are uh, arrested uh, online. Seventy-three percent. Seventy-three. That is a staggering statistic. Yes, this is uh, yes, this is uh, very very yes, and uh, and the, the and even worse is that. 20% of in in 20 percent of these cases, this kind of online harassment uh, uh, turns into uh, into physical violence and physical attacks. So there is nothing virtual about uh, online violence, and we have to be uh, and to be and we have to be very conscious about. It's not virtual, it's not just a minor thing, it's not something that we should underestimate. It's a real problem, and at the same time, it's, uh, it, it represents a real threat to pluralism in our societies, because there are a lot of women leaving the profession uh, because they don't want to be exposed to this kind of constant harassment uh, that can even turn into uh, physical violence. Indeed, so. and who can blame them? Yes. Um, so uh, these issues are being taken very seriously, um, not just here, but at the highest levels in Europe. And we have a message of support now from the Council of Europe. Over recent years, an increasing number of European journalists have been attacked, even murdered, often with no one ever prosecuted. This is a direct assault on press freedom. But it can be stopped. The European Convention on Human Rights guarantees freedom of expression and the Council of Europe has developed tools to safeguard media workers. Where governments apply these, journalists have greater confidence to go about their work. Work that is essential to a healthy democracy. Well, it was good to get that message of support, but it does bring to the fore how extreme the threats can be, including the murders of journalists, for instance, Peter Arde Fries, we've heard of the um, crime journalists here in the Netherlands. Why is it that those who are ultimately responsible get away with it, and what can we do about that? Yeah, mm -hmm. the impunity rate is uh, staggering high. Um, Eight out of ten of the murder cases is not even investigated or prosecuted, so perpetrators are still um, free, running free at large. Um, what we can do about it, um, as Minister Hoekstra already mentioned, and uh, I applaud him for that, is uh, setting up a special task force for investigations. Um, and bringing together experts on this and providing advice to countries who maybe have the lack of capacity to investigate these kind of cases uh, or have uh, not enough resources to do so. So that's one thing. But also I would uh, like to stress is that if an investigation takes place, um, the investigators also should look at uh, the work the journalist actually has done. Is that part of uh, why the journalist was murdered? Because in that case, it would be a violation of both the right to live as well as the right to freedom of expression. Um, and we need to make sure, of course, that all the perpetrators are um, uh, prosecuted and brought to justice. Um, Secondly, I would, or thirdly, I would also um, mention that all kind of violations should be investigated. So not only murders, but also the online violation, as uh, Theresa mentioned uh, clearly. Um, and this is uh, something that goes maybe beyond the states, because platforms here has a, a, a very important role to play as well. Um, the violations that happen on the internet goes largely without any punishment whatsoever. Uh, where we here in the real world so, world, so to say, have regulations, rule of law, on the internet they are not. So that is absolutely something that we need to work and to tackle as well. Thanks, Ruth. Um, I do believe we might have a question from one of our journalism students for our panel. Um, Julia, who, which one of you is Julia? That's Julia me. Timter, who would you like to put your question to and what is it? Thank you very much. My name is Julia Timta from the uh, Windesheim University of Applied Sciences and I have a question for uh, Ruth Kronenberg. 
Um, what if politicians who, who maybe question our credibility or they accuse us of spreading fake news or they contribute to the hatred towards journalists, do you think we as journalists should fight back against powerful people who make it difficult for us to do our jobs? The short answer is yes, <laughs> we should. <laughs> journalists should. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's of course uh, a, a very sad thing that even elected politicians um, call names to journalists like scumbags or sewers rags. Um, they're actually fueling uh, the, the aggressive behavior of normal citizens who turn against mainstream media. I mean, we've seen in the Netherlands what, uh, uh, what the result of that is, that... Uh, um, the public broadcaster cannot even put their logo on the vans anymore in order to protect the reporters. And uh, one of the um, journalists received a firebomb in, in, the, in his mailbox. I mean, come on. Um, so yes, journalists should uh, <laughs> be more uh, counteractive to that. Okay, and I must quickly say, not the ministers and politicians who've joined us for this discussion, of course, who've been staunch supporters of what we're trying to do, which is to promote the safety and security of journalists. At this point, I shall say a big thank you to Minister Milanova, to Minister Tom Tugendhat, Teresa Ribeiro, and Ruth Cronenberg for joining us for a lively debate. Next up, we're going to be discussing freedom of expression online. And uh, we've asked some young journalists, remember I showed you, introduced you to them earlier, the journalists of tomorrow, you might want to say, to reflect on some of the key challenges which they encounter with online media. Let's have a look at their verdict. How goes it? Good. 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 Uh, are you excited to be here? Yes, what about you? Yes, also a bit. <laughs> this Looking is my forward school. to the summit. To be honest, I am a little bit scared about the future of media and future of freedom of press. I think it's also really important that people are honest to each other. And it, it is hard to see when someone is honest or not. The future of uh, free press I see mixed. Because in the news we see a lot of articles where you see that the journalists are attacked. Do you have TikTok? Yes, I do have TikTok. <laughs> I'm the TikToker. And, and do you use uh, other social media? Yeah, I do have other social media like Instagram. I have Facebook. I have WhatsApp is also social media. <laughs> Snapchat, YouTube. A lot it's a lot. Yeah, it's very hard to trust anybody if you talk about media because I don't know what's true. I, I'm not there where it's happened, so I just have to trust somebody. But how can I know if it's true if even political parties are spreading fake news, if even governments are spreading fake news, if you can make a deep fake and uh, let President Biden confess something that he started the war in Ukraine? How do I know if that's real or not? So the news is not always true also. Yeah. Or it is from one perspective, so you yes, right. don't know how to see it's that. Very hard, so it's so. very hard for us people who, to see what is real and what isn't. Yes, right. And what are like solutions for that problem? What would make it easier for us to separate it? That's a trick question. <laughs> I think I think adults have a good p position in when we talk about honesty because you see sometimes that. Also, adults, they're not being honest to, to the world, to the media, in the media. So it is also hard for us in our generation to see, okay, what is fake news, what is real news. Do you think old people are slower than us? I think they're not used to it because when they were younger, they didn't have social media, they didn't have Instagram. Phone. Uh, they didn't have a phone, maybe. I'm asking you to do something with action. We have to make some changes if we're talking about freedom of press, media and absolutely fake news. You must listen to young people because young people has an other, have another perspective at the world. And you as people from 40 or 60 years old are be behind us. And for the changes we need, we have to work together. Because right now we see in a lot of countries, also in the Netherlands, polarization. So we only look at the differences and not at the similarities. And only with the similarities we can unite. 
My message is make sure that we get the right information, be honest to us, and work together with us because then we can make the world a better place. Let's hear it for our budding journalists. <laughs> Merzad Lazimani, I'm dead impressed, but I'm not sure I like the our old people slower line, <laughs> honestly. Some respect, huh? You're going to become such good journalists. Now, um, we saw some of the challenges that uh, we, we face. You know, online media is, uh, gives us uh, new voices, our young young people here, our young friends here, but it, we're also bathed in a world of fake news, aren't we? So how do we balance this? Hmm? How do we make sure that we keep the gold and get rid of the chaff? That's what we're going to be discussing now, the veracity of online media. And let me introduce you to some of our wonderful guests here. Amanda Bennett is the CEO of the US Agency for Global Media, and she is an extremely important person in the global media landscape, as it were. Welcome, Amanda. Ricardo Gutierrez is General Secretary for the European Federation of Journalists and uh, represents very many journalists across Europe. Catherine Anite is a member of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom. And Nogar Schrester is a creator himself. He runs the Dutch Instagram account Politica Jongeren or Political Youth. Welcome to you all. Before we get stuck into our discussion, we're going to watch a short video entitled From, Pluris From Pluralism to Fake News. New digital technologies have given people new possibilities to express themselves. Today, everyone can create their own online platform with their own message for their own audience, giving voice to the voiceless. But technological developments also present new challenges. Digital authoritarianism is on the rise, restricting civic space and curtailing human rights and fundamental freedoms. Ce que je veux, c'est que les personnes qui seraient considérées comme des pestiférés, à qui on interdirait les réseaux sociaux, ce soit ceux qui harcèlent, qui privent de la liberté des gens, ceux qui menacent de mort, ceux qui incitent au suicide. Et je veux plus jamais qu'on fasse culpabiliser les victimes. Hate speech and online threats harm journalists and media workers. And the growing spread of online disinformation erodes public trust in journalism and democratic institutions. How can we address these challenges without restricting the right to freedom of expression? How indeed. Well, I'd like to put that question first to Amanda Bennett. But first, can you tell us what is the US Agency for Global Media? It's something of a powerhouse. Um, and how do you deal with this seemingly inherent contradiction of, on the one hand, having a plurality of voices, on the other, the scope for fake news and disinformation? Thank you very much. Um, the U.S. Agency for Global Media is the agency of, in the United States that holds Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, the Office of Cuba Broadcasting, Middle East Broadcast Networks, and a new um, entity that uh, called the Open Technology Fund that is very important to this discussion. Okay. So give us your thoughts. So you, that, it's a lot of journalists, a lot of languages, I guess. Um, give us your thoughts on how we, we, we preserve the freedom of expression online while at the same time trying to defend against disinformation. There's, there's all kinds of threats against journalists like this, from, from cyber from cyberbullying to um, cyber hacks. I think there's a lot of people here who will be able to talk more to that than, than, than I can. What we think about is that we flood the zone with good journalism, good information. So if people are trying to restrict the ability of us to do our work, which is basically what this harassment is all about, is to stop you from working, we refuse to stop working. And we yeah. provide places that have no other access to it believable, trustworthy news and information, because even though people are very vulnerable to, to the bad information, they're not completely vulnerable to it, and they still desire it, they seek it out, so we provide it to them. Ricardo Gutierrez, a very important commodity, trust is at stake here, isn't it? We see soaring um, 
social seesawing disinformation at the same time plummeting trust in journalism. That's not a coincidence, surely. No, uh, but first of all, I, I fully agree what what this just been said. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe that the the best. Uh, uh, strategy, the best uh, antidote to disinformation is uh, quality information, is ethical uh, journalism. So, um, as a journalist, as a representative of journalists uh, in, in Europe, I, I'm not afraid by, by uh, you know, the flow of disinformation because it highlights the role of, of journalists. And um, I believe it, it um, empowered uh, journalists. You know, we, we've, we've seen journalists more conscious about uh, their role, uh, the need for them to respect uh, ethical uh, rules, uh, maybe to be more transparent as well on their own work. Um, there is a change of attitude from journalists, and, and I see it as, as something very positive. And indeed, uh, let's promote quality and ethical journalism. That's the best way to, to tackle this information. Nuka Shrestha, as we saw from our report from our young journalists earlier, um, people have a hard time differ differentiating facts from disinformation, right? So is there a role, do you think, a responsibility almost that creators have in this, in this area? Definitely. That's a big, big responsibility. Uh, it's something I try to achieve uh, in my platform. Uh, I've been a teacher at the university, and one of the first things uh, students get taught at the university is find credible sources. Um, so from my experience, I know how important it is to have credible sources. Uh, when you bring the news, uh, when you inform people, your audience, um, and you see the developments with fake news yeah, coming through over the past years. And that, that has been one of my frustrations as well, to actively engage um, yeah, to to create this platform and to inform people in a... Was that one of your motivations? That was one of my motivations, ah. I would say, yeah. Interesting. And so tell us a bit about the platform, Political uh, Jongeren. So yeah, it's Politieke Jongeren. It's, it's Dutch for political youth. And it's a political media platform, uh, which I started during my studies when I was a bachelor student, to share my frustrations with, uh, yeah, with social inequalities, but also with the rise of um, yeah, right-wing extremism, which was normalized in the political arena, in the media arena. Um, so I shared my thoughts through the platform uh, in a very accessible way, and it came to grow into a platform that uh, now reaches over 150,000 young people in the Netherlands. Um, so nowadays, I yeah, it's more of a, it became more of like a a job, I would say, next to my uh, full-time job, uh, to inform young people, to uh, to engage them, to critically reflect on people in power. Um, so this is a positive story, <coughs> isn't it? The way in which, because we have an online media space, you've got so many new voices. It, it was po probably wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. Yeah. So I, I want to bring in a legal perspective now from, from Catherine Anite. Um, you're on this high-level legal advisory panel, um, and we're talking about fake news, but I, I understand that fake news can actually be, be used in a legal form to target journalists, to, to flip against journalists, which was a new thing for me to discover. Tell us what's going on there and what, 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 what we can do about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would firstly want to thank the, the Dutch uh, government for convening this very important conversation. And as the high level panel, we have reached out, you know, to states, you know, to provide uh, legal opinion on various issues that would promote freedom of expression. Um, one of the things that is affecting free speech across the world now is fake news disinformation. Um, and we realize that a lot of states are using these provisions. Um, to sort of stifle and shrink the space. But these are vague and ambiguous. And most times when you look into the provisions, they actually border uh, already existing uh, restrictions like criminal defamation. So uh, we, as the panel, are advising rather than using uh, legal restrictions, you know, to invest in media platforms so we can have verification uh, tools, um, like fact checking as well. So um, also look into platforms and ensure that the self-regulation of those platforms is transparent. Um, as you had the comic earlier on today say, you know, 
from uh, Trump's uh, statement of this is fake news, fake news, uh, we realize that the pro proliferation of fake news laws um, is, you know, f about a decade old. Um, and this also came with a digital era. So previously, states were, you know, easily, they would easily find you wherever you are. But with the internet, you could write something while in the Netherlands and um, they cannot easily find you. So they're trying to control rather than regulate the space. So we are finding um, really it hard to uh, look at uh, fake news laws, especially with the decriminalization of these laws across the different parts of the world. We have the uh, European standards from the European Court that calls for decriminalization, the African Court adopting European standards. So um, for us, it's not about legislation, but using other means to combat um, fake news. Thank you very much, Catherine. I saw you nodding. Richard, did you want to add something? Yes, uh, I should say that uh, as journalists, we, we face more and more, um, there is a flow, there is a, a trend, a, a growing trend of um, smear campaigns uh, against uh, journalists. So uh, I would say that, um, you know, uh, we're talking about freedom of expression online. Uh, the, the freedom of expression is not the, the freedom um, to insult journalists. It's not the, the freedom to harass journalists or to threaten them. And it's, it's becoming a very worrying uh, trend all over Europe. That's, that's not something you know, specific to one, one country. Uh, so that's the real challenge you, well, in your introduction, you, you, you pointed out, you know, the, the challenge is to how, how to tackle this information, how to regulate in a way uh, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the scope without, well, while preserving freedom of expression. Uh, and, and I should say that um, some governments are using uh, as a pretext, you know, the, the, the need to regulate or to uh, preserve, to secure in a way uh, the, the online environment by taking some laws which are just uh, directed, you know, with, with the intention to control, as you said, mm. uh, the, the media and, and not to protect uh, citizens uh, or, or journalists. Yeah, so it's very sinister, isn't it? It is. Mm. It is. Um, I just want to move on now to, we've talked a lot about uh, disinformation and the way in which uh, journalists themselves are being targeted. But what about the way in which regimes um, control access to the internet in the first place, or, or shut it down, or restrict it to certain media sites? Um, what are your thoughts on that, Amanda, and, and what can be done about it? Yes, thank you, because you have to remember that every single thing we've been talking about today, the purpose is to keep us from reaching the true news, the real news, everything, the, the attacks, the, the calling fake news. So what we have to do is find new ways of getting this information out. So another way people try and get the, the real news away from us is to shut down the internet. So one of the things that um, we do through the Open Technology Fund is we develop new tools to get around internet shutdowns, to get the news into countries that are, that are shut down. For example, like, like VPNs. VPNs, I'm sure everybody has heard of VPNs and have used them. We develop and provide VPNs to people in other countries. And for example, during the, um, the protests in, in Iran just recently, uh, over the death of the, the young woman, over the headscarf issue, um, by the middle of the time that was, uh, their protests were happening, one in four Iranian adults were using VPNs that were provided by our organization. And you can see that people want this. We can see that people want real news because what we find is when we provide the VPNs, you can see the digital traffic, it goes like this. And then all of a sudden it goes like that. Because people want it. They still want it, which means that our obligation is to fight back against all of these things that we're seeing and we're talking about today by making sure they can get it. We were hearing earlier, I think from one of the politicians in our opening segment about the, the way in which malign influences can affect the democratic process. And we're not going to go into details here or point any fingers. But listening to you earlier, Noga, I was thinking to myself, well, actually, it can work the other way around too, can't it? Because you, what you're trying to do is to bring new people in to talk about politics, yes? 
Yeah. So I wonder if you could share your thoughts on the way in which platforms like yours can actually influence the democratic process. So it definitely gives a space uh, for young people, for example, or people who don't have a voice or the, or the tools to get to the places to share information. Um, so platforms like Instagram do give people the option or the possibilities to uh, create platforms to do this. Uh, but I think we also have to stay critical of platforms like Meta and uh, other tech platforms who, are, who enable these things um, because they have a lot of power mm. still. Uh, so it's, I think it's both ways. It, it gives us opportunities, but we have to stay critical how, how it's regulated because sometimes uh, these platforms like Twitter also, there are a lot of platforms where news is shared. Um, they have a lot of power at the moment and I think we have to stay critical about that as well. So what, is, what do you think should be the role of tech platforms then in broadening the availability of, of young and new voices? Um, I think they could um, stay critical of themselves and also engage with uh, politics in how they use their platforms. I think last week there was a hearing in U.S. Congress about TikTok. Um, I think this should be this should happen more. Like the the platform should be asked questions and how do you how do you regulate your content? Uh, what do you do with it? How do you censor? Um, so really question the power as well of these platforms is very important for the for the political uh, people in power at the moment. So we live in a digital world, and that means also we are vulnerable to cyber security, all of us, threats. Um, and I wondered if you had any legal uh, angle, legal perspective that you could share with us, Catherine, in the way in which cyber security, or cyber security targeting has taken place against journalists, surveillance, for instance. We know about Sp Pegasus spyware. Can, can you give us a comment on that? Yeah, most definitely. Just to contextualize, um, I think earlier on, one of um, the speakers said, um, you know, we have dropped, global freedom has dropped 17, uh, for the 17th as consecutive year, and that includes freedom of expression and media, which has been a key factor in contributing to that decline. Um, and one of the restrictions that we are looking at mainly, cyber security and surveillance, um, and when we look at what is happening in Europe, for example, um, the, the NSO group that has developed the Pegasus uh, spyware, uh, currently there are about 15 lawsuits happening across the world. Um, the UK, the US, Hungary, Spain, um, Israel, um, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates and other countries that have brought suits against states using this spyware. Um, but one issue that we are seeing is that the target, which is the media and other human rights defenders, um, do not have tools to sort of counter Pegasus. So, well, there are some civil society organizations that have developed forensic tools, but that is more um, reactive and responsive than preventive. So the issue here is how do we counter that. I mean, Europe is much more advanced than other parts of the world, but I know that one of the greatest steps that has been taken is by the EU Parliament. So in March and uh, November of last year, 2022, the Parliament set up a special committee of inquiry, you know, to look into the usage and acquisition of this spyware. And uh, the report came out, the draft report came out in January of this year. And um, in its findings, um, some of the countries were found in violation of uh, you know, surveillance laws. So for example, Poland, Hungary, uh, and uh, the big question here is accountability. How are they going to be held accountable? Um, and just this Monday, uh, the US President uh, Biden has uh, issued an executive order, you know, to stop uh, the, the usage of spyware, you know, that would affect human rights. And I think that's a great step to combating this. And we would call upon other countries to adopt these 
positive measures. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a threat that needs to be taken very seriously yeah. for all journalists. I have to say, when I was an investigative journalist, I'm very glad we didn't have this spyware around. Otherwise, I would have, you know, it, 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 it makes you think twice as to whether you want to go down certain lines of investigation, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I believe we've got a, a question from one of our journalism students. Um, which of you is Rosaline? That's me. Hi. Who do you want to put your question to and what is it? I'd like to ask a question to Ricardo Gutierrez. Um, I'm, by the way, from the University of Tilburg of Applied Sciences of Journalism. And I'd like to ask you if you have any advice for young journalists like us who feel in this polarizing climate, increasing pressure to avoid coming off as political. Um, how can we keep sight of the factual narrative above any labels we might receive online or backlash? Good question. I, I think the, the important point is to stick to the... I mentioned, you know, the, the ethical commitment of journalists. And yes. I, I, I think, I really believe that uh, when you face... Um, uh, such a climate, uh, we should more than ever before stick to to the the, the ethical rules. You know, the respect for truth, um, and um, which is the main article of all ethical charters. You know, uh, you know, to tell the truth. Um, and um, yes, uh, one major danger I think is uh, self censorship. Yep. So you 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 should think about it. Uh, we. Uh, participated uh, a few years ago uh, to the first academic study on self-censorship among journalists in, in Europe. Um, 1,000 journalists surveyed all over Europe, and 30% of them admitted, you know, they sometimes uh, self-censor mm. themselves. It, the real figure is higher, of course, because it's in a way, you know, it's difficult for a journalist to admit that you are. For sure. So, uh, exactly. So we believe that it's a real issue and uh, it's really important. The best protection, you know, it, uh, against that attitude, uh, do not give up, uh, <laughs> stay. Yeah, that's, that's important. And uh, share your issues with the colleagues, uh, with the journalist association, the journalist unions. Uh, and you're not uh, alone. Exactly. Yeah. Not to be, not to speak. Yeah, to share your issues and to stick to uh, uh, ethical commitments. It's a great question, Rosaline. We've barely scratched the surface of this huge subject, um, but we're out of time, so I'm going to say a big thank you to all our guests, Amanda Bennett, Ricardo Gutierrez, Noga Shrestha, and Catherine Anita. You're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you. And to wrap up our discussion, we're just going to show you a short video made by RNW Media and DS, a youth news website from Moldova. Access to reliable information is a crucial element in thriving and healthy democracies. At DS, we try to challenge young people to think about alternative scenarios that help them form an independent opinion about the realities of their world and important topics. I have a special focus on Russian-speaking Moldovans as they have only few reliable sources and are exposed to online disinformation in the Russian language. Digital media and online platforms can be a powerful tool to promote access to information, freedom of speech and transparency, but at the same time they can be a threat by spreading misinformation and hate speech. It can lead to them becoming harmful for democracy. Our job is to create safe communities, to encourage constructive conversations online, to expose young people to multiple viewpoints in order to be more prepared to fight this information. So now we're going to look at a really important topic, and that is how can we make sure that independent media, often small players, actually survive? against all these threats. Financially, it can be very precarious. So we're going to have a discussion now with Mira Selva, CEO of Internews Europe. Welcome, Mira. Nick Benekista, Senior Director for the Center of International Media and Assistance. And Mira Milosevic, Executive Director of the Global Forum for Media Development, who's done a lot of work on this issue over the last year or so. First, a short video to set up what we're discussing here, how to bolster the financial independence of small media outlets. Media freedom 
and freedom of expression require unconditional support for the laws and regulations that guarantee these principles. Also, at times when the incumbent political or administrative power does not like it. Os relatos que ouvimos hoje e que aqui nos ajudam a perceber que em Portugal também não podemos continuar a fingir que esta realidade não existia na Igreja Católica. Although the importance of a free, diverse and independent media is ever growing, media organizations are struggling to survive financially. How can independent media perform their democratic function at risk of financial extinction? We need a plural and trustworthy media that monitor and control power from different angles and platforms. 2018 és 2022 között ebbe az épületbe élő műsorba ellenzéki vezető összesen 5 percre, 4 év alatt 5 percre mehetett be, amíg a miniszterelnök minden héten egy órát kap élő adásba, hogy elmondhassa, amit akarna. To provide everyone with the information that helps people to form a well-founded opinion. We need proactive efforts for the financial viability of small media organizations and local news outlets. We need public policies and new funding models to support journalists and media to perform their vital role in democracy as a watchdog and an agenda setter, and to make sure that independent, diverse and free media will survive and thrive in the coming decades. So let's get straight down to it then. How do we make sure that often quite small media outlets actually survive? Mm -hmm. Mira Milhochevich. Thank you, uh, Nisha. Uh, we, we are here in the context of uh, Summit for Democracy, and uh, we work together with our colleagues uh, within the media cohort to look at the issues of how to support media, uh, both internationally and at home. And uh, there are uh, attempts, especially here in Europe, to address this decline in, uh, in media freedom and also media pluralism in some of the uh, regions of Europe. So uh, at the uh, legislative level here in the European Union, we have European Media Freedom Act uh, at the moment being drafted, setting up um, a lot of protections against capture of media, but also some of the requirements for well-functioning media markets. So that's one of the area uh, where a lot of progress can be done uh, to set up institutions and mechanisms also that can uh, support media. So. Uh, one of the things that has been tried around the world is uh, uh, providing official subsidies for media at home, uh, especially, as you say, those small and local ones that are particularly um, under threat or uh, have a, a compromised business model because of all the uh, uh, challenges that we've heard uh, about before. Then uh, you can have indirect um, aid uh, for uh, as uh, tax subsidies uh, and uh, support, uh, um, for instance, uh, um, relief for uh, VAT on print. Uh, and things like that. Then um, uh, you can also uh, provide uh, uh, journalism uh, the status of a charitable cause, so those who support the journalism can support it better. So those are all some of the instruments that uh, have been uh, 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 tried and tested in, in many of the countries, uh, especially here in the region in Europe. Then. Um, there is a big effort uh, in terms of regulation of the online markets, uh, because that's uh, where we had a, almost a Wild West mm. situation, and uh, there hasn't been, um, not even level playing field is a, is a not strong enough expression. So there hasn't been uh, opportunities for media and journalism to actually establish uh, financial uh, income from, from digital advertising markets uh, and uh, to monetize their audience. So we'll dive into some of those, you know, yes. slice it up in the course of this discussion. Yes. Just yes. give us an overview, though. I'm going to ask you exactly the same question, yes. Mira Selva. You've established the Media Viability Accelerator yes. Yes. Project. What are the learnings? How do we actually make sure that small, important voices survive? Well, there are two things to consider here, which is that the media is different in different markets and different sectors. So in any solution, what's really important is to make sure that you don't accidentally end up in a situation that benefits existing media and uh, the existing big companies and 
crowds out smaller media. And then the second on, uh, part of this is to make sure that the advertising revenue that goes towards news gets directed as far as possible towards high quality independent media. So one thing we're doing at Internews is a project called Ads for News where we work with Group M, which is a large media investment agency, to encourage advertising companies to ensure that a percentage of their revenue goes towards high quality news. And this is really important because it's part of a wider trend where people would rather not be associated with news. Mm. If you're selling chocolate ice cream, you possibly don't want your product ne you know, next to a story about the war in Ukraine because it creates a kind of different kind of emotion. And what we need to really do is advocate for journalism and say, to have a kind of functioning democratic society, you do need to ensure that there is financial viability of news. And that means sometimes making tough decisions, such as putting money towards Think, you know, news that is difficult to read and difficult to consume, but still really, has really a wider purpose. has a much wider purpose. Mm. And then the second part of that is the relationship with the public. And certainly in Europe, many of the media markets have populations that can afford to subscribe to a media outlet or to pay a membership model. So you really want to make sure that is facilitated, that they are encouraged to do so, that there is a connection with the public to advocate to kind of say this is why it's important. So I want to bring um, Nick Benquista in at this point. How would one do that, draw the public in for something like this, with so many challenges in the world, climate change, health crises, economic challenges? H how do we say actually the survival of independent media is really important? Well, um, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. And um, look, I think Martia Sen, the Nobel laureate, you know, made the case over 20 years ago that uh, democracy, and as a part of that, media freedom and vitality is fundamental to all forms of human development, to human mm. progress. And I think uh, 20 years since he wrote um, free, uh, Development is Freedom, uh, I think we've learned in the most unfortunate way just how right he is. Uh, you know, amid the absolute collapse of the funding model for for, for media freedom, for, for journalism, uh, amid declines in media freedom, uh, we see now that in the countries where media freedom falls, uh, other democratic rights and liberties fall like dominoes. You see that in the data from uh, the VDEM, uh, University of Gothenburg data set. <clears throat> and you know, all of us having lived through the pandemic saw the human toll and cost uh, of living in a situation where citizens can no longer distinguish trustworthy information from misinformation and disinformation. So, uh, look, we have a lot of work to do. Public uh, support uh, for freedom of expression has been pretty stagnant around the world. Uh, people have a lot of questions about whether news is worth saving, um, but I think we have the case to make now that whether you care about poverty, the environment, uh, peace and stability in the world, uh, the one transversal and fundamental issue to all other issues is preserving an information ecosystem that allows us to continue to make that progress. So I think. So, so what role do tech companies then have, Mira Milosevic? Well, um, actually, getting onto a platform is the key battle mm. for, for many small media outlets, isn't it? Yes, we heard from colleagues in the previous panel what are the challenges of doing journalism online. And, uh, and of course, uh, all those challenges uh, impact the ability of journalists and journalism organizations to uh, exist and do business as well online. Uh, so for instance, I'll give you some examples. Uh, just recently, we had uh, a conversation with, with our colleagues in Ukraine. So what they're facing online is uh, rules around violent uh, content uh, uh, and graphic uh, content. And so uh, all the platforms limit what you can publish and post online when you uh, report on violent um, incidents. And of course, if you're reporting on the war, how are you going to do that? So there is a limit there. Then uh, a lot of uh, platforms do not recognize journalism organizations and accounts. So a lot of accounts get suspended. And we have a research that shows that, for instance, around 40% of all small journalism organizations don't have anyone to call. And if they send email, uh, you know, the response is very slow. So that's that kind of uh, role of social media that's the first layer around moderation of account and content that's actually is uh, uh, essential for it you seems to exist, so, It right? seems so kind of practical and surely solvable. Uh, 
Uh, well, it's solvable if you uh, uh, don't look at incentives of uh, the big online platforms. But if you look at architecture and incentives, they are incentivized for profit making at scale and at uh, uh, earning advertising revenues from any type of content. And so they didn't make an effort to designate who are those users and accounts online that have, as Ricardo was pointing out, and previous speakers, ethical journalism mm. norms. So that's something that, that's on that content side. And of course, there is the whole business side and the uh, opaqueness of the digital advertising market. Well, advertising is clearly a lifeline, a financial lifeline for the survival of all media. I mean, what can be done, do you think, from a governmental point of view to try and create more of a level playing field so that there are more carrots rather than sticks for independent media? Well, I think one worrying trend we're seeing in advertising um, in Europe as well as much of the rest of the world is the weaponization of advertising revenue by governments themselves, so governments that decide to direct their kind of public advertising That's a big funds. word, weaponization of It is absolutely advertising. weaponization, though, because it's they deliberately freeze out critical media, only give public ad public advertising revenue to media that is friendly, um, and then that has two, uh, two, two kind of impacts, which it really freezes out the independent media. It also sends a signal to the private sector. So if you are the kind of chief executive of a large oil company and the government is very pointedly only giving advertising to one type of the media, you really think twice about bucking the trend and spreading your advertising revenue as, an, mm. as a private advertiser elsewhere. So it puts kind of public and private squeeze on independent media. And I think it's something that can be called out. It can be identified. It can be called out. I think governments have a duty of kind of best practice to ensure that they, they don't kind of do this and that they, they very publicly make sure that the revenue is distributed equally across the media sector. So, Nick Benkisa, you were talking about Amartya Sen and um, freedom of expression being a development issue. Um, do you think that there's more that the international community can do in terms of making sure that some of development monies go into things like supporting free media as opposed to... Well, there are so many things that are clamoring for develop development funds. Yeah, much more. Much, much more. So, I think there's three things, essentially. One is more money. Uh, ensuring that that money is more effectively spent and third is international support for political will. And you know, when it comes to the money, uh, there's about $180 billion that's spent on international assistance, uh, you know, fighting to end hunger and poverty and environmental degradation. Um, only 0.3% of that $180 billion is spent in support of the media sector. A defining uh, challenge of our time gets a tiny fraction of that assistance. So look, spend more. And I hope the government of Netherlands is listening and others, you know, at least 1% of budgets can be dedicated to the media sector at a minimum. Second, um, GFMD, Mira, uh, and uh, SEMA, <clears throat> together with the OECD, we're working to define kind of principles for effective support to media development. This is like the best practices uh, that donors can follow. Um, there's a lot of very basic things that can be done to ensure that the support we're providing is really long-term and strategic and that it hits these structural issues uh, that uh, Mira was talking about. So um, we need to implement those. And then finally, political will. You know, look, there's many ways of solving the problem. You know, in Europe, public broadcasting is a huge part of a healthy information ecosystem. In other countries, you know, a commercially driven model is gonna be important, but it doesn't matter which model you choose, you need the political will to protect those public broadcasters, you need the political will to ensure that those advertising markets remain transparent and open and fair. So, uh, you know, the work being done here is actually really helpful for that. Um, Mira Milosevic, um, you've been leading the Media Freedom Cohort's uh, working group on this very area, supporting the financial viability of independent media. Can you boil down your, the recommendations from the group? It's difficult, but let's say that we have three broad groups of uh, uh, commitments and interesting uh, innovative projects that have been suggested by the group. One, uh, one area is around, obviously, funding and finance. 
and finding ways to uh, join forces, pull funds, and uh, uh, do better with little we have. So there are uh, some new initiatives, such as uh, International Fund for Public Interest Media, that's, uh, uh, ha that has been an initiative, actually, of the first Summit for Democracy. Then uh, there are initiatives from uh, Media Development Investment Fund, like a Pluralis Fund, that uh, funds uh, access to investment and finance in Central and uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, there are some other uh, uh, funds, like a Free Press Action Fund, actually, in, uh, in the US. So that's one bucket. The other bucket is around uh, collaboration and collective action, and also sharing knowledge, information, and learning. And that's really important, because we need to be as effective as possible uh, if we have that 0.3% and investment in media is uh, 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 is not uh, is not big, and uh, uh, and there we have a couple of projects uh, from uh, a lot of uh, media development organizations, including uh, Free Press Unlimited, that is hosting us uh, uh, here. And then uh, uh, Mira has been mentioning some of the uh, innovative uh, uh, projects um, uh, that uh, support a business model, and uh, and those are working with private sector, especially. Uh, with some platforms as well, but uh, uh, especially with uh, with advertisers and uh, working uh, with uh, ethical councils and uh, producing standards, for instance, such as uh, uh, Reporters Without Borders uh, Journalism uh, Trust Initiative that could help us potentially solve all those issues uh, where journalists and journalism organizations are actually not recognized online. So these are just some of a uh, few recommendations that um, uh, colleagues have uh, uh, put into the report. Yes, I requested you to summarize it. Yes. And we've heard a number <laughs> of detailed initiatives in the course of this discussion. But I'd like to just ask a kind of bigger question is, isn't there a kind of existential threat that the news media faces at the moment? Because there's so much else that we can do other than news. And getting a boy, getting, getting through is so very difficult with a key message, especially if you're trying to do it in a sober, fact-checking, reliable sort of way. Um, I, I, let me ask you that, Nick Binkies, there. How do we break through amid the flood of disinformation? It's a key, key part of survival, isn't it? Uh, it is, and I think, um, look, you know, I think we have to look to inspiration from, from Ukraine at the moment, actually. You know, it's, there are, it, Ukraine is fighting for its survival, um, and one of the things that Ukrainians are fighting for there is to preserve that information space. And uh, it's been really remarkable and inspiring and humbling to see the journalists uh, working on starvation wages, uh, amid a collapse of advertising in Ukraine, volunteering their time to keep the information flowing, um, and keeping their eyes on the future in terms of revitalizing a sector that they have worked so hard over the last 10 years uh, to turn into a vibrant and strong independent media uh, sector with solidarity from the international community. Um, you know, 120 million, a very small amount, was spent in support of the, the efforts in Ukraine to forge a really strong and independent media sector, um, that, that solidarity has been incredibly valuable. Ukrainians today, as, as uh, Administrator Power uh, highlighted earlier, even under Russian occupation, are still finding the information they need. Uh, they're more resilient than ever to disinformation. Um, and uh, I think it's a very extreme example yeah. you've given us, yeah. <laughs> Nick. But, there. But I, I believe that one of our, our student journalists would like to put a question. Which one of you would like to enter home? Go on, to introduce yourself, and who would you like to put your question to? Well, I'm Robert, and I'm from the Edith School of Journalism. And I would like to ask how can we make sure that all that money goes not only to the shareholders of a company, but also to the freelancers? Because if we don't have freelancers, we mostly do the work, we don't have a media sector. Good question. Mira Selva. It's a very, very good question. And um, there's two issues there, which is the news organizations that hire freelancers really need to ensure that they're paid fairly accurate on time, given protection and safety when they're being sent out in the field to report. And then there's the other part of... Um, 
the kind of knowing where the freelancers are. So we really kind of like to work with organisations such as the Rory Peck Trust, others to kind of ensure that we that the freelancers know that there are resources for them, and then also that we kind of know where to find people when in distress. Related to that. Um, Again, an extreme example, what we're seeing more and more of the world is journalists in exile. So journalists who weren't freelancers, mm. who were working for newsrooms in their own countries, who had to flee um, and whose newsrooms were dismantled, so became freelancers with no planning, no backup. Um, and this is a real priority as well to ensure that they are supported and that they can continue to report um, because they're really like the Noah's Ark of journalism. They're, they're what's going to keep the, the media sector in their country alive till hopefully they can return. It's such important work yeah. you're doing. Thank um, you. Mira, Nick, and the other Mira, thank you very much for joining us for this session on thank Democracy you. Summit for Democracy. I'm going to let our guests vacate, and our, our meeting is drawing to a close. We've got uh, two small interventions left, and um, they are from our creatives. First, let's cross over and meet Martin the cartoonist. What have you been working on? Can you show us? Can you dazzle us? Hello, Nisha. I hope it uh, can be shown. Uh, what I've been doing all this time, you have uh, given me uh, some nice input. Um, I, I oh, we're happy to oblige. Yeah. Can people see what to do? Okay, so here is a kind of... Uh, I go through the cartoons in Please a very do. quick way. You can see them later on, maybe uh, in uh, more seconds. So here is the voting system standing for democracy, democrat, uh, dem democratic country. And it's uh, being chopped off by all these uh, red things, like an axe and uh, a soul and uh, a bullet. Ah, that's what you heard from us. Yes, that, that was a strange input, it was. So here is a grave of the press. Uh, it was a nice interview, though, and it's press here. Oh. So, yeah, that's, uh, it's all about the threats. I'm, I'm not... Uh, yes, I don't, I don't... One feels uncomfortable laughing at that, and yet laugh one no, must. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not drawing about Utopia, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, drawing the, the harsh reality. I'm yeah, show, show us one more. I know you've got a whole lot, but show us one okay, more. Okay, so here's the social media. We're going in. And... Uh, <laughs> well, that's drawn a laugh or two, or shall I say a titter from our audience. Okay, then I put this one on. Journalists, but, but what if the government finds out? Why not bring Christianity to Iran? <laughs> So that's, that would be much safer, presumably. <laughs> okay, give, a, give us a final cartoon. Uh, give us a final. You had which is your one. Which is your most favorite? Uh, this one already? Uh, the army? No, that's the press. Ooh. <laughs> I like this one anyway. <laughs> okay, there are more, but uh, you can see more of that maybe in uh, a summary later Thank on. you so much, Vati Valdering. Your creativity is awesome, honestly. Um, now, we've received words of support from a great number of countries in the region who are committed to support us in taking these steps. We're going to be showing them to you in a bit, in sequence. But first now, that moment I've been waiting for, I'm going to hand over the floor to our spoken word artist, Lev Avitan. Take it away, Lev. Thank you. We've built a house with no walls, just mighty pillars. Told people it's theirs, they were free to roam around and within it. We asked them to take care of the foundation of which the structure rests, for without those simple pillars, there is no house here left. This fragile home we've called democracy is not fixed and set in stone. It deteriorates in some climates and is bolstered when it's honed. This home could be a place of safety, of justice, and of bliss, but without the proper measures, it crumbles into remiss. One of those mighty pillars is the one of information, which seeks to guarantee that the public has a stable basis for decision-making. We create an understanding of the world, gained through what we see, be it with our eyes, in the papers, or on TV, but increasingly, we've been caught up in a machine called social media. We've set it free because we believe that something like a tweet can be equated to a well-reasoned and substantiated claim, those we used in science, research, and debates. But perhaps an unregulated, profit-driven algorithm is not the proper way to disseminate information. But is it all bad? 
Can we not critically reflect on power on social media? Trying to counter the hateful extreme rising in the political arena? Can we not through VPNs facilitate real news for all of us to reach and for the young to find each other when all the trust is breached? For in an age of anti-intellectualism, where truths change based on postal codes, where echo chambers can make one believe that it's the real world they know, where experts and professionals are discredited or seen as a nuisance, where remarks from politicians have led to threats or violent attacks on our journalists, where mobs of people grab their pitchforks when they're not happy with what they heard, and where women and minorities are affected extra hard. But can we only blame the public for sometimes being so mistaken? Are they in their right to be distrustful when information leaks but accountability isn't taken? Are we really surprised when we find out finances influence the framing of the content? Because this essential pillar of information has also been pulled into the market. You see, there's a thin line between voicing these concerns and rejecting the competence of so many brave journalists doing their important work being on the front line, risking their lives, setting their light on the dark corners of the world, while being harassed, even murdered, subjected to aggression, making journalism one of the most dangerous profession. And this assault on the freedom of expression caused media workers to be muted, with their very perpetrators never being persecuted. So how do we protect those who give voice to the voiceless? How do we foster the plurality of perspectives while making sure that safety and quality is upholded. The, the situation is dire, so let us invest globally to provide the good guys all the means to win the war of information that goes on on all our screens. Yes, our dear democracy is deeply under threat, so let's take, of its, let's take care of its foundations and otherwise risking collapse. Thank you very much. Lev Avitan, that was awesome. And I hope you'll call it a plurality of voices. Dear friends and colleagues, wherever you may be joining us here in the studio and online, thank you for joining this broadcast, this live broadcast from The Hague in the Netherlands, part of the Summit for Democracy, about the importance of media, a free media, to uphold the values of democracy. I'm Nisha Pillay, and it's been my pleasure being with you. Until the next time, goodbye. Excellencies, dear colleagues, I thank the Kingdom of Netherlands for hosting this event and dedicating it to the topic of media freedom, one of the pillars of any democratic society. Where the freedom of expression as a universal human right must be respected and protected by all countries, global reports and freedom indexes paint an alarming picture Media freedom is in decline and violence against journalists is on the rise. We are grateful for the indispensable role of free and pluralistic media in providing the international community with factual and timely information. At the same time, we continue to lose lives of dozens of journalists in war zones. They heroically report on the crimes and abuses perpetrated by oppressive regimes. Dear colleagues, Latvia defends freedom of speech with a range of practical measures. First, our assistance goes to ensure the continued work of Ukrainian independent media in war conditions. Second, several independent Russian media organizations and journalists under the threat of repression and censorship have re relocated to Latvia. A similar step was taken by the Moscow bureaus of media outlets like Radio Free Europe and Deutsche Welle. The media hub Riga, established by our civil society and supported by the Latvian government, provides practical help to journalists in danger. 
When standing up for freedom of speech and media pluralism, we must also invest in our own resilience. Our online information environment must be free, open and inclusive. At the same time, it needs to be safe, secure and resilient to the hostile manipulation by authoritarian adversaries. Therefore, together with Canada and the Alliance of Securing Democracy, Latvia leads the cohort on information integrity to counter the spread of disinformation. I wish you fruitful discussions in the Netherlands and let us reinforce our efforts to strengthen democracy through freedom of speech, media diversity and a healthy information space. Esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, talking of a free press, we emphasize the value of the press acting independently of the state, sometimes providing information on matters that governments would prefer not to make public. As a former editor-in-chief and journalist, I know full well from my own experience the importance of being able to function without interference from the state since one of the aspects of our work was to scrutinize and make public the actions of the government. My colleagues and I had to face a number of so-called criminal cases and verdicts with trumped up charges aimed at silencing the independent press. So I know better than anyone the challenges and difficulties the media representatives might encounter during their work. Realizing the importance of freedom of speech and free expression, our government provides all the mechanisms for developing free press as an essential part of true democracy. Armenia is continuously implementing reforms aimed at improving its legislation for ensuring better environment for media and the journalists to implement their professional duties safely and freely. Thanks to it, last year, Armenia recorded unprecedented progress in the World Press Freedom Index, improving its position by 12 points and ranking 51st on the list of 180 countries. According to Freedom House's Internet Freedom 2022 index, Armenia qualifies as a free among 70 countries. In the era of technological advancement, when the concept of journalism has elevated to the online platform, more efforts and actions are required to deal with the protection of the rights of those concerned. Nowadays, we should admit that some new challenges emerge for the freedom of media, speech and expression. That is fake news that become a real problem for democratic countries. But even this challenge isn't able to derail us from our belief. Freedom of media and speech is a pillar for democracy. We didn't put any restrictions on media freedom and internet, even during the 2020 large-scale war initiated by Azerbaijan against Nagorno-Karabakh. In this context, I would like to highlight the issues of safety for media professionals. I wish to take this opportunity to pay a tribute to a number of courageous media workers who were risking their lives in conflict areas around the world. The rights of free press and expression must be respected and protected at all times. I would like to reiterate that Armenia will be in the future as well fully supporting and promoting international efforts aimed at ensuring free and independent media. Thank you. Media freedom and freedom of expression go hand in hand. They are essential pillars 
of any democracy, because together they guarantee plurality of opinions and inclusiveness. Journalists also hold politicians and economic actors to account. This important role comes with great risks. Unsurprisingly, authoritarian regimes prefer to suppress freedom of expression altogether in order to crush dissent. But media freedom is never a given, even in democracies. No are journalists only at risk in conflict areas or in dictatorships. Many have been killed for uncovering environmental scandals or corruption cases. Many more are harassed, threatened or impeded to do their work. As we know, women journalists and media workers are disproportionately targeted by online harassment, sexism and trolling. Finally, the fast development of social media has brought about a new threat to media, freedom and uh, freedom of expression. Disinformation, which shows doubt in the minds of citizens in order to undermine democratic institutions and to polarize societies. <clears throat> so, how can we better protect media freedom? I see three areas which need our continued engagement. Advocacy. As member states, we should use every opportunity to voice our political support for the work of independent media and the better protection of journalists. Luxembourg is a member of the Media Freedom Court and the Freedom, and the Freedom Online Coalition, as well as various related groups uh, of friends in the UN system. Legislation. Member states must improve their legal framework regarding the protection of journalists, both off and online. And measures need to be taken in order to forbid surveillance through spyware and to avoid political interfering in editorial decisions. Financing. Member states, together with the private sector, should explore financial support schemes in line with the Council of Europe's declaration on the financial sustainability of quality journalism in the digital age of 2019. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, although we can agree that our democracies are each special in their own way, the commitment to core values and principles is something we share in common as demonstrated by our participation in this event today. Freedom of speech is the backbone of a democratic society as a whole, but it is also the driver of social, uh, social changes that will promote and improve our everyday lives. Building on the, that fact that independent media, freedom of expression and access to information are some of the pillars of democracy. The government of the Republic of Serbia is continuously working to ensure that the conditions for the unhindered activity of the media and the safety of journalists are in place. Serbia is also a member of the Global Media Freedom Coalition, and uh, I personally signed the Global Pledge on Media Freedom, on media freedom at the conference in London. The action plan for the implementation of the media strategy was ad adopted recently. Efforts are being made to draft the amendments to the law on public information and media. The drafting of the action plan for the implementation of the strategy for the development of the public information system has been underway. We consider it, it uh, particularly important to create adequate conditions for free expression on digital platforms, which will prevent the manipulation of information, that is, maintain a balance between freedom of expression and the protection of privacy. To this end, a working group was formed to amend the law on electronic, electronic media in order to harmonize in with the EU regulatory framework. 
Adoption of the new law on electronic communications is planned for the first half of the 2023. In order to respond promptly to threats and uh, intimidation to which media workers are exposed, the SOS line for reporting threats and attacks on journalists is open 24 hours a day. As part of comprehensive efforts in the field of gender equality, the government's program for women's empowerment in the field of information and communication technologies includes not only female journalists, but also female university and school students. While working diligently on the implementation of the Agenda 2030, the competent governmental institutions cooperate closely with media and the journalist association, associations and the civil sector, and also with international experts hired in cooperation with the EU and the OSCE. Aware of the importance of uh, continuous action in order to overcome the challenges we face in terms of protecting freedom of expression, Serbia will continue to make efforts aimed at strengthening the integrity of the media space and all its participants. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, and best greetings from Helsinki. The right to versatile and reliable information, freedom of opinion and speech, and the opportunity to participate in public debate are an essential part of fundamental and human rights and democratic society. Finland has a long tradition of media freedom. According to the World Press Freedom Index 2022 by Reporters Without Borders, Finland ranks number five in the world. From the Finnish experience, we know that people's trust in public administration, state institutions and media is crucial. When you have transparent political and judicial institutions, and journalists and media workers are free to do their jobs, people feel secure. Unfortunately, the safety of journalists is not a given in this world. Far from it, journalists around the world continue to face deliberate attacks from physical violence and arbitrary detention to other threats like harassment, online abuse and censorship. The current hybrid media environment poses new opportunities and challenges as internet and social media have made it possible to transmit information directly to great number of people. For democracy, the rise of social media can be considered a positive development as it has increased diversity of the media environment. On the other hand, disinformation, misinformation, anti-democracy sentiment and hate speech also spread more effectively through the media than before. Finally, the media plays an important role in our changed security environment. For stability of the society, it's essential that people can access information even in exceptional circumstances and in situations of disruption. During crisis, the importance and influence of information increases. The media must be prepared for it. And the rest of society must protect journalists and media workers so that they can perform their vital function. Finland remains committed to defend freedom of speech and opinion, free media and the safety of journalists together with its allies, including in the European Union and the Media Freedom Coalition. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I participate in this event, part of the Second Summit for Democracy on Media Freedom. I would like to warmly thank our co-host, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, for this pertinent and timely gathering, and in particular, my friend Göpke. Media freedom is a cornerstone of democracy and a precondition of its well-functioning. We are saddened and concerned by the increase of threats to media freedom into the safety of journalists and media workers, especially women. The proliferation of such abuses, often facilitated by the misuse of digital technologies, requires effective international coordination to address them. 
Greece is pleased to be participating in the Media Freedom Cohort within the framework of the United States-led Summit for Democracy. Greece also participates in the Media Freedom Coalition and other dedicated alliance of like-minded countries. We have been actively promoting media freedom at home as well as abroad. Since 2013, Greece has been submitting the resolution of the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity to the Third Committee of the United Nations General Assembly. We submit this resolution together with like-minded states like Argentina, Austria, Costa Rica, France and Tunisia. Last year, the Greek government established a national multi-stakeholder mechanism, the Task Force on Ensuring the Protection, Safety and Enhancement of the Status of Journalists and Media Professionals. Its main goal is to enhance policy coherence on this important issue. Dear participant, as a final word, I would like to reiterate my country's commitment to contributing to the creation of free, independent and diverse media worldwide. Diverse media which will serve as a foundation of peaceful, inclusive and resilient societies. I wish you every success in your discussions today. Thank you. Distinguished guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to extend my sincerest appreciation to the Kingdom of the Netherlands for organizing the European Regional Event of the Second Summit for the Democracy and to all the colleagues who have made this significant gathering possible. Freedom of expression is one of the basic conditions for the progress of society. Yet we all see that the independent media remain under pressure today. Journalists are under threat all over the world, including in Europe, on a daily basis. Different forms of violence against journalists have increased significantly, from physical attacks to intimidation and harassment targeted surveillance and cyberbullying. Moreover, we are witnessing persisting attacks both online and offline, particularly on women journalists. Digital technology is creating new threats. They range from online attacks against journalists to orchestrated online disinformation campaigns and dissemination of news with no public accountability and little transparency. Being fully aware of these challenges, Croatia is pleased to emphasize that we are signatory to various international treaties and recommendations concerning the freedom of expression and media freedom. We are continuously improving our normative framework in order to ensure the highest standards of, for all media operating in Croatia. By signing the Media Freedom Global Pledge, Croatia in 2021 became a member of the Media Freedom Coalition. Within our foreign policy activities, we further commit to support and co-sponsor the initiatives with strong provisions for strengthening media freedom, safety of journalists and tackling impunity for violence against them. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, without safeguards for the safety of journalists, there can be no free media. Without free media, human rights and democracy are under threat. No community, no country, no nation, no region can prosper if the media freedom is denied. It should also be clear that without the participation of all of us, we cannot achieve full and effective results. We have a collective responsibility and a moral duty to preserve the media freedom. Creation will continue efforts to build professional and safe journalism, media freedom and media pluralism, and further develop processes for providing reliable information about issues of public interest. Summits like this and uh, our joint effort and cooperation should posit positively contribute to our final goal, a world of true and overarching media freedom. Thank you, danke Welle. Colleagues and partners, we live in a challenging time for peace and democracy. In Europe, Russia's brutal war on Ukraine is also an attack on democracy. But it's not the only threat to democracy in Europe. In several countries, those threats 
come from within. Across the world, we see attempts to weaken democratic institutions and the rule of law, to limit civic space and to silence journalists and independent media. Such attempts undermine the open and informed public debate that is fundamental to any true democracy. The Summit for Democracy brings forward new ideas on how to advance media freedom at home and abroad. This work must continue and we will be a part of it. Norway has a high level of press freedom. We will continue to share our experience and we have renewed our commitments to action. All our support to media freedom and development will seek to ensure women's participation and to protect their safety. Abuse and violence against women journalists cannot be tolerated, neither online nor offline. NOAA will continue to implement our strategy on freedom of expression. We will do so in close cooperation with our civil society partners, UNESCO and media organisations. Press feed freedom and access to information for all is at the heart of our efforts. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I wish to commend the United States government for organizing the second summit for democracy. I would also like to thank the government of the Netherlands for leading today's discussion on an issue of central importance in any democratic society, that of media freedom. It is beyond dispute that media freedom is challenged and even attacked. Widespread harassment intimidation and persecution of media actors is, regrettably, all too common. Moreover, repression against civil society activists and human rights defenders is systematic. The unabated crackdown on independent media, individual journalists, political opposition members and other critical voices infect the fiber of democracy and one of its core elements, the freedom of expression. At a time that fake news and disinformation spread with unprecedented speed, we need, more than ever, to rely on credible and independent information sources. Journalists, especially female journalists, face threats, harassment and violent attacks. Therefore, governments and international organizations have a crucial role in protecting journalism. This is nowadays urgent. Cyprus is adding its voice in condemning the repression and intimidation campaigns against journalists and civil society. These voices are indispensable to the defense of democracy and pluralism. Today's event represents a first-rate opportunity to highlight the necessity of media freedom. We must ensure its protection and further its promotion. I therefore look forward to an open dialogue and an exchange on best practices so that tangible results can be achieved. Thank you for your attention. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, media freedom is a cornerstone of a fully functioning and strong democracy. Thus, Malta has sought to focus its efforts during this year of action in preparation for the second summit for democracy on strengthening media freedom and the protection of journalists. In this regard, I wish to outline some of the initiatives undertaken so far, as well as some envisaged for the future. A committee of experts on the media was appointed in January of last year to analyze the journalism and the media sector and advise the government on several legislative amendments. These legislative amendments are currently going through a consultation process with the aim of strengthening the role of journalists and their significant contribution to the functioning of democracy. They include the introduction of anti slap provisions and an amendment to the Code of Organization and Civil Procedure. In terms of penalties relating to threats to journalists as well as libel suits, relating to deceased authors. Standard operating procedures on managing and responding to threats to life 
have been developed and put into practice by the Malta Police Force. We will also establish a committee focused solely on the protection of journalists and other media professionals. The Constitution will also be amended to include a new article that explicitly recognizes media freedom and the role of the media as a public watchdog, together with the right to practice journalism freely. Malta will also work to facilitate the work of journalists by developing a more modern and efficient online platform for freedom and information requests. I wish to convey Malta's appreciation for the work done by the Netherlands to organize this regional meeting and co-leading on the Media Freedom Cohort together with Canada. It was of a great satisfaction to work with partners on an ambitious set of commitments to advance media freedom. I also take the opportunity to commend civil society, media workers and journalists for their work and dedication. To conclude, Malta will keep working with its partners to ensure that journalists are protected and allowed to fulfill their fundamental role of keeping the public informed and the institutions also accountable. This is a crucial role to ensure that we have strong democratic institutions. Thank you. Dear colleagues, greetings from Lisbon to all participants. I would like to thank my Dutch colleagues for convening this multi-stakeholder event on media freedom, as well as for their leadership at the Media Freedom Coalition, along with Canada and the UK. This Summit for Democracy is an opportunity for nations to reaffirm their firm commitment to democracy and to democratic values. And what better way to do that than to vigorously uphold media freedom? Dear colleagues, we all share the conviction that freedom of the media is a cornerstone of every democratic society. A true democracy has to allow the scrutiny of public decisions and policies and to foster a free public debate about the concerns and the ambitions of its citizens. And authorities must be accountable for their decisions and their policies. The free media plays an irreplaceable role in any true democracy. It should actively encourage the participation of civil society the exchange of ideas should promote a diverse and pluralistic media. This requires engagement and everyday efforts from all of us, governments, civil society and media actors. Portugal ranks number seven in the World Press Freedom Index. The Portuguese constitution and laws are clear in this regard and so is our practice at all levels. Portugal is fully committed to respect and to protect media freedom as well as the rights and safety of journalists. Our legal framework has been established to cater to the specific needs of journalists. Notably, the Portuguese Penal Code lays down provisions that enhance the penalties for offences against journalists. There can be no room for impunity in relation to the safety of journalists and other media workers. In Portugal, harassment or violence against journalists, including women journalists, both online and offline, has fortunately not been an issue of much concern. Data available through the annual report of the Portuguese Regulatory Authority for the Media uh, also addresses gender-related issues. However, in many parts of the world, journalists and media workers are being targeted, attacked, and their work severely constrained. We have been training journalists through our development aid programs and promoting cooperation between Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa and in Asia. We support initiatives by global and regional intergovernmental organizations, EU institutions, media platforms, think tanks, acad academia and CSOs, and of course coalitions of states such as the MFC with the aim of protecting the work of journalists and media freedom. The MFC has been playing an important role in publicly denouncing situations of harassment or unlawful arrest of journalists and media workers through the release of joint statements. And we also highlight the valuable work carried out by the OSCE representative on freedom of the media. In a time when trust in democracy is under attack, we also need to fight disinformation with objective journalism 
and an independent media landscape, while avoiding the risk of imposing undue restrictions. Let me be clear, an attack on journalists and media workers is an attack on our democracies. We look forward to continuing our joint work to ensure media freedom and stronger democracies. Thank you. Je remercie le ministre néerlandais des Affaires étrangères d'avoir pris l'initiative de cette réunion très importante sur la liberté de la presse et des médias qui est de plus en plus menacée. Car de plus en plus de journalistes sont pris pour cible, empêchés de travailler, voire tués comme tant en Ukraine, détenus comme en Russie, en Biélorussie, au Mali ou encore en Afghanistan, ou menacés comme dans tant et tant de pays. Avec ses partenaires européens, la France est engagée pour la protection des journalistes et des professionnels des médias. Nous devons collectivement renforcer nos efforts. Et c'est pourquoi nous lançons aujourd'hui un appel à lutter ensemble contre les procédures abusives, les intimidations, les pressions que les régimes autoritaires utilisent pour baïonner la vérité. Agir pour la liberté de la presse, c'est aussi garantir son pluralisme et son indépendance par des règles et par un soutien aux médias, notamment aux plus petits dans les pays en développement. La France apporte pour cela un soutien financier de plus de 35 millions d'euros. Comme je m'y étais engagée, elle finance aussi le Fonds international pour les médias d'intérêt public, créé l'an dernier au Forum de Paris pour la paix, et ceci à hauteur de 15 millions d'euros. Agir pour la liberté de la presse, c'est aussi protéger les libertés et les droits de l'homme dans l'espace numérique. J'ai lancé le 8 mars les travaux pour élaborer une première stratégie internationale pour la protection et la promotion des droits des femmes dans l'environnement numérique. Agir pour la liberté de la presse, c'est enfin protéger la vérité lorsqu'elle est attaquée. Nous devons lutter contre les manipulations de l'information et la désinformation. La France y emploie par exemple au sein de l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie. Enfin, les plateformes numériques et les réseaux sociaux ne peuvent être des arbitres autoproclamés pour décider de ce qui en ligne est vrai ou faux, autorisé ou interdit. Comme l'Union européenne, nous devons tous exiger une plus grande transparence et une vraie responsabilité de leur part. La France soutient en ce sens la création d'un code mondial de l'intégrité de l'information publique par les Nations Unies et a lancé le partenariat pour l'information et la démocratie. J'appelle tous nos partenaires à soutenir l'initiative pour la confiance dans le journalisme qui permet de promouvoir les médias indépendants et les règles d'éthique. La France continuera de jouer pleinement son rôle pour la protection des journalistes et de la liberté de la presse comme pour préserver l'espace informationnel qui est un bien commun. In 2021, in Brussels, a journalist from a public service media was assaulted and injured while covering a protest against COVID-19 measures. Even in the country hosting the EU's main institutions, the unhindered work of journalists cannot always be taken for granted. Worldwide, 533 journalists are currently detained. There are also many reports of harassment and intimidation. No less than 86 journalists and media workers were killed in 2022 around the world. What can we do? To fight disinformation, Belgium asks for media freedom at the UN, at the OSCE, at the Council of Europe and at the European Union. As a member of the UN Human Rights Council, we will continue our support, notably to the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Belgium is also supporting the functioning of the Council of Europe's platform that reports on serious threats to journalists and media freedom. Belgium helps the Belarusian independent media through the European Endowment for Democracy and furthermore, Belgium supports the Council of Europe's uh, for activities with Belarusian journalists in exile. 
We all have to act to give journalists and media workers a voice. This is just what Belgium is doing with the project Afghanistan Monitoring Hub. This project aims to enable Afghan journalists to continue collecting, analyzing information on the ground in Afghanistan and disseminating it to the Afghan population and to the international community. The project ensures that the necessary measures are put in place to minimize the risk for these journalists, because there cannot be democracy without critical voice of journalists. I thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to congratulate the Netherlands for hosting this event on media freedom, a cornerstone topic of the Summit for Democracy. Widespread fake news and propaganda gain ground, fueled by numerous crises and amplified by new technologies and social networks. This is a serious problem for the democratic institutions and the responsible media outlets and journalists. The main challenge that all democracies faced, however, is to strike the balance between protection of the freedom of speech and countering the fake news and nefarious propaganda. We must always remember that there is no democracy without the freedom of speech. Bulgaria's commitment to media freedom, to the highest international standards and the respective good practices is unwavering. It is expressed in active participation and support of all international mechanisms aimed at ensuring media freedom and the safety of journalists. In a world of growing interdependencies, the state of media freedom abroad is equally important for us. Consolidating media freedom in the Western Balkans is a topic of particular relevance. Unfortunately, hate speech and even calls for violence continue to spread unchecked throughout the media environment in some countries of the region. The problem needs to be addressed urgently, ascending to a higher standard of media freedom, independence and professionalism will undoubtedly facilitate and accelerate the process of European integration in the Western Balkans. Bulgaria stands ready to assist all efforts to advance media freedom regionally and in a wider context. Thank you. Slobodni i nezavisni mediji su stup svake demokratije koje su potrebne tačne činjenice i informacije kako bi društvo bilo informisano na pravi način i donosilo odgovarajuće mišljenje. Novinari i novinarke treba da rade u ambijentu u koje mogu u potpunosti da budu slobodni i profesionalni i da izvještavaju o svim društvenim temama, a naša obaveza je da kreiranjem javnih politika doprinesemo uspostavljanju takvog ambijenta. Ministarstvo kulture i medija je u napređenje slobode medija stavilo na vrh svoje agende, uključujući njihovu zaštitu i nesmetan rad, jer znamo da bez slobodnih medija nema ni slobodnog društva. Nijedan slučaj napada na novinara njihovu bezbjednost i imovinu medija ne smije biti arhiviran bez konkretnog policijskog, tužilačkog i sudskog razrešenja. U Ministarstvu kulture i medija smo svjesni činjenice da je medijska oblast Oblast koja se mijenja ubrzano zbog tehnološkog napretka, te u tom kontekstu potrebno je kontinuirano raditi na unapređenju zakonodavstva u skladu sa najvišim međunarodnim standardima. Uvažavajući realne potrebe za unapređenje medijskog ambijenta, a u cilju iskladživanja sa najvišim međunarodnim standardima, nastavljamo da sprovodimo reformu medijskog zakonodavstva koja se ogleda u pripremi novog zakona o audiovizualnim medijskim uslugama, zatim zakona o medijima i zakona o javnom medijskom servisu RTCG. Nakon završetka prvog kruga presjedničkih izbora, još jednom je dokazana važnost sistemskog pristupa u formulisanju zakonskih rešenja koja preciziraju prava i obaveza medija, nadležnih organa za sprovođenje zakona i svih drugih subjekata koji su na direktan ili indirektan način uključeni u izborni proces i medijsko predstavljanje u toku njega. Finalizovali smo aktivnosti na izradi medijske strategije Crne Gore, kojom je kroz transparentnost procesa u saradnji sa medijskom zajednicom, civilnim sektorom, državnim organima i svim zainteresovanim subjektima definisalo pravce razvoja i sveukupnog unapređenja oblasti medija. Duboko vjerujem da će ovaj strateški dokument 
uz paket medijskih zakona biti dobar okvir za buduće konkretne aktivnosti usmjerene na unapređenje ambijenta za rad, medija i medijskih sloboda. Dear representatives of participating states, the media, civil society, academia, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to hold the position as Minister for Culture. This portfolio includes many important issues, not least media and democracy policy, two policy areas that go hand in hand. Free and pluralistic media is at the heart of democracy and a cornerstone of an open and vibrant society. Freedom of expression has a long tradition and a strong position in Sweden. More than 250 years ago, Sweden was a pioneer in making freedom of the press part of its constitution. Today, we are one of the countries with the greatest media freedom. In the last edition of the Press Freedom Index, published by Reporters Without Borders, Sweden finished in third place. It is fundamental that journalists should be able to carry out their mission. All forms of threats and crimes targeting journalists constitute an attack not only to an individual, but also on the democratic society. Therefore, Work for the safety of journalists is a central part of Swedish media policy. To summarize, media policy is first and foremost about safeguarding the fundamental rights of freedom of speech and freedom of expression. However, in a recently released report, Freedom House concludes that among the many rights under attack globally, Freedom of expression has declined more than any other civil liberty. Infringement on the free expression of media and individuals is one of the biggest drivers of global democratic decline. It is important to say that violations of freedom of expression and attacks on the media are not taking place in a vacuum. In fact, it is often the first alarming sign of an autocratic tendencies of conflict. Right now, a process is underway in the EU to set a common legal framework to ensure a fundamental responsibility to protect the diversity and independence of the media at a European level. Sweden is currently chairing these negotiations on the European Media Freedom Act. Let me conclude by emphasizing the importance we attach to these issues globally. Sweden is a strong defender for freedom of expression and media freedom and one of the largest donors in support of these core components of democracy worldwide. Because the work for media freedom is not something just one country or one organization can do. It is something that we must do together, every day and everywhere. Thank you for listening. I thank the Netherlands for hosting this conference and co-leading the Media Freedom Cohort. Independent media is key to well-functioning democracies. Therefore, states should undertake positive steps towards ensuring that journalists can work in safety and without undue restrictions. However, the prevailing impunity for attacks against journalists and media workers in many regions of the world results in a climate of intimidation, self-censorship, and even violence that enables further violations. It is particularly concerning that, according to Reporters Without Borders, journalists are being increasingly frequently detained. Furthermore, the world has never seen as many women journalists in detention as today. We are particularly concerned about the attacks against journalists, media workers, and human rights defenders in Belarus, which may amount to crimes against humanity, according to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Currently, at least 32 journalists remain behind bars in Belarus. We must continue advocacy for their release and seek accountability for crimes against them. It is also important to provide practical support, including humanitarian visas and financial aid, to the Russian and Belarusian independent journalists and media workers fleeing their regime's repression. Lithuania, in recent years, has become one of the hubs sheltering these journalists. Besides physical threats, journalists and media workers around the world are also challenged by surveillance, internet shutdowns, and other offensive digital restrictions, 
as well as by the use of strategic lawsuits against public participation, SLAPs. Therefore, adequate legislative protection is needed. Last year, Lithuania adopted rules to protect its journalists, media workers and civil society from such lawsuits. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Summit for Democracy is a unique opportunity to unite our efforts to ensure the safety of journalists and media workers, both online and offline, and to take necessary steps to ensure accountability for crimes against them. I thank you. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizer for setting up this event. It's a very timely debate because media plays a critical role as it enables the participatory democracy. It acts as a critical watchdog over holders of political, economic and social power. But unfortunately, the context in which journalists work has become more dangerous in recent years. Romania endorsed the political declaration of the high-level conference of safety of journalists protecting media to protect democracy in Vienna last year, marking the 10th anniversary of the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists. At the same time, the lack of security for journalists fundamentally undermines the freedom of media. A relevant example in this sense is Russia's illegal, unjustified and unprovoked war in Ukraine, during which the Russian bombings led to the death of several journalists. Targeting and threatening journalists, slap cases, spurious arrests and even assassinations are being used by the authoritarian regimes and criminal non-state actors. These practices amount to a direct undermining of democracy and democratic accountability. Such acts, ladies and gentlemen, must be resolutely condemned and Romania adds its voice to those that express concern over the safety of journalists worldwide in this event. Supporting best practices in this field, legal counseling and sustainable funding are avenues we need to use when it comes to safety of journalism. The Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs includes the media in all its public diplomacy activities. Going beyond the obligation of public information, we have developed a culture of transparency centered on the proactive transmission of information to the press, including by formal and informal debriefings. Regarding the effective support of civil society and mass media, the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs granted two voluntary contributions of more than a half a million euros through the European Endowment for Democracy for projects in support of civil society and independent media in the Republic of Moldova. We have also supported the International Accountability Platform for Belarus by granting a voluntary contribution to support civil society and independent media in Belarus. Disinformation poses a growing threat on democratic processes as well. Since we are so much exposed to disinformation, spread of hate speech, conspiracy theories and divisive rhetorics, it is mandatory to empower the civil society to identify and expose disinformation. Civil society needs to be encouraged and concretely supported to get involved in the fight against disinformation campaign, to promote media freedom and education, to expose disinformation campaigns and to counteract them by highlighting the truth to the general audiences. The Russian aggression against Ukraine is the most recent instance in which systematic information manipulation and disinformation have been applied as an operational war tool. Ladies and gentlemen, I will conclude by recalling that it is essential that democracies learn how to adapt and consolidate their societal resilience in order to combat the above-mentioned threats and crises. This cannot be done without including media freedom as a prerequisite of healthy democracy. Romania firmly stands for the free and strong media and for media freedom. I'm looking forward to learn more about your debates and dialogue and I wish you success with the debate today. Thank you.